Right, so uh, good morning everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed the social event uh, last night and I'm really glad you managed to come here despite the public transportation problems and the, and the strike. Let's hope that everybody else will also manage to arrive uh, soon. So it's a really great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sebastian Riedel, uh, who is uh, with uh, Facebook AI Research and also uh, UCL uh, in London. Um, again, um, keeping with the tradition of the previous days, we we're not really saying much, almost anything about the speakers themselves, but they are all really amazing people, and this also applies to uh, Sebastian. So make sure that you visit their pages and you know check what they have been doing. So thanks again, Sebastian. Thank you. Was that really the tradition, or did you just make it up for me? I'm sure you <laughs> went it is, it really is a long length uh, with everybody else. Uh, great. No, thank you. That, that's great. I like it that way. Um, all right. Um, Thanks so much uh, for inviting me, first of all. I really enjoy my time here so far. One of the things I noticed that I thought were really, really cool, uh, especially coming from Brexit UK right now, is that here you get discounts for being a European, which I think is pretty amazing. I still don't know how I foot, should feel about it. It feels a bit discriminative. But uh, anyway, I feel very welcomed in Athens in many ways, which is great. Uh, so this is the, a tutorial on machine reading. It's Presented by me, but really also worked by Johannes, who is a PhD student at, uh, at UCL, and Dirk, who is now at Google Brain in Germany, and Antoine and Angela at FAIR, who have been working on the slides as well. All right. Um, just a uh, um, bit of information. If you have any questions, please shoot at any time. Uh, I, I like these lectures to be interactive as much as possible, so please do ask. All right, um, if you looked at the news last year uh, and you followed sort of AI-related news, you might have come across headlines like this. Robots can now read better than humans putting millions of jobs at risk. Uh, and really, this talk is all about that. Um, in reality, obviously, that's not at all the case. Uh, and we're really like tens, twenty, hundreds of years away, maybe from... from machines that read better than humans. But like what we can say is that robots now can pattern match on benchmark data sets uh, better than humans, which is an entirely different thing. I'll talk about that for quite a while. Um, but on a more upbeat note, uh, I think there has been an amazing amount of progress in the area of machine reading. And activity in that space has skyrocketed, uh, which I think is interesting for you, both from the perspective of being possibly a researcher in the field, but also being a uh, practitioner who wants to apply the progress that we're making in the real world. So to give you a high level overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, try to give you a bit of context. What is machine reading? And um, why should we care? Then I'll talk a bit about methods. Uh, what are the paradigms in machine reading? and uh, how are they implemented. Then I'll talk a bit about challenges. Uh, why is machine reading hard when it is hard? Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of current approaches? And then talk a bit about tools and resources. Um, in particular, what data sets are important. Machine reading, as I guess most areas in NLP right now, is, is driven entirely by large benchmark data sets. And, uh, you see a long list of, of such data sets coming up in this presentation. They're all interesting and important. So I'll talk about those, maybe a bit about tools available, time permitting. Notice I'll focus on a relatively broad, high level view. So I'm going to go through a couple of uh, aspects of machine reading, give you maybe an example of one way to handle that aspect. But I'm not going to deep dive into something for a long time, which I think in a way is good because you can read up upon these things later on if you want more details, but I'll try and give you an overview of what's out there, and then you can see what picks your interest. Uh, it also means that I think there will be certainly cases where I can't give you all the details, <coughs> even if I wanted to, uh, in which case I just point you to the paper as well, or you talk to me offline and we'll figure it out. All right, so what is machine reading? Um, if you go on, Google Scholar, and you search for that term before 2006, 
you see that it's something else entirely. It's maybe um, cars reading the traffic lights or something like that. Uh, but then starting around 2006, 2014, uh, there is a new definition of machine reading means in the context of natural language processing. And this was driven a lot by a large DARPA project at the time on the topic of machine reading. And here the idea is in general to take text and turn it into a representation of the meaning of that text that the machines can understand. And uh, what you see there is the actual image that the DARPA designed for this program. Um, and I think it's quite cute because if you zoom in, you can actually see this, uh, this robot writing down logical forms that capture the meaning of all the books that it's reading. And that's really visualizing well what, at the time, research, researchers thought of as machine reading. Now, if you fast forward to about 2014, there has been a different way of interpreting machine reading. And in particular, people have looked at it from the point of what I call end-to-end -end question answering. So rather than taking a large body of text, then sort of representing it somehow in a uh, computer readable form, you just read as you need with a given question in mind. And you let the machine do that reading for you and answering the question right away. Uh, so, so you're given some kind of question you're given some kind of text, then you have some kind of neural network, and it produces the answer for it. Uh, and that is what I think today most people understand as machine reading. These things aren't that different, they're, but they're different paradigms to essentially helping the machine to fill some kind of information need. In this tutorial, I'll talk about both of these, these paradigms. Um, I sort of generalize those to machines that convert some kind of text into some kind of meaning representation, which is then used for um, an information need. The difference between these two paradigms in this view is that in one paradigm, the information need sort of controls the meaning representation together with the input text. So instead of saying, oh, you know, I'll read it and then I'll presented in the best way possible for all future use cases. I'm not doing that. I'm doing it condition on what my need is, on condition of what my question is. So that's pretty much what I just said. Now, why would we want to do machine reading? I, I think of two high-level reasons for that. One is just the growth and explosion of data uh, that we're all very familiar with. So if you look at PubMed publications, PubMed publications in, uh, I guess, the last 100 or so years, then there has been an exponential increase. And uh, for researchers or, or users of that information, it becomes harder and harder to go through this. So if we can get a machine to read all of that and then directly fulfill our information needs, that's got to be a good thing. Um, the other motivation I like to give comes more from the perspective of, of AI and, and our uh, endeavor to, to find general intelligence. Like if, if you look at what uh, the bottleneck is for most of applications in NAI, it is the knowledge that the agent has or doesn't have. Um, so we, we can program machines to do all kinds of complex tasks. The reason why we can do them is because we have sort of prior knowledge that knowledge is really hard to get into machines. So one way to get that knowledge into machines, and that doesn't just relate to like, scanning a, uh, the PubMed database, it might also relate to reading how to, learning how to play a game or learning how to do any kind of action. That knowledge can come through text. There are various applications that people look at in the context of machine reading. Like the classic one is just Question in, question answer out, question answering. So um, what city Tesla moved to in 8080? Uh, the answer is Prague if you read this text. And there's a lot of 
work on, on using this kind of uh, task in, in, in actual practical applications. Another thing that I mentioned was to actually help agents to learn faster. So there was some early work back in 2012 where um, researchers at MIT showed that uh, you can teach a machine to play better civilization by reading the manual before, um, which is, is something that we usually do as well. Like, so you can learn to play civilization just by, uh, by doing, but you learn much faster if you actually just have a look at the, at the fucking manual. So uh, you can do this with Go as well or with chess. We had uh, at UCL some, uh, some master student in our NOP course and they just did all of this with chess and ended up in the MIT review, which I thought was pretty amazing. Um, so they had a way to read chess literature and then play better chess. Um, there are also more serious and, and useful applications such as supporting a molecular tumor board. So these are people who look at the molecular uh, genetic profile of a patient and then try to infer the best way to treat them. Uh, actually, that requires a lot of scanning through literature, finding the specific uh, relevant information for this profile. There's work that does that, uh, but helps or uses machines to help, the, help in the process. All right, so that's in terms of applications of machine reading. Just to give you a high-level overview of approaches, uh, one of the classic approaches to machine reading is what I call semantic parsing. Here the idea is that you take a text and then you map it into first-order logic uh, or some other kind of quite rich and expressive logical formalism. Uh, that's something I'm not going to talk much about in this in this uh, tutorial. What I will talk about is the idea of taking text and then mapping it to a so-called knowledge graph or knowledge base where you have entities or nodes representing the entities mentioned in text and edges representing the relations between these entities. And I'll go through the whole pipeline of things you need to do in order to get from here to here. Um, and then, as I said earlier, there's this idea of enter and machine comprehension where we do represent the meaning of the text, but we use the question as an input to that meaning representation to get the best possible answer. And you use end-to-end -end deep learning to actually train this thing. All right, so where do we see you here? I guess uh, I think of you, and I didn't have a photo of any of you, so I took Andreas, who is unfortunately not here, as an example of the Athens NLP summer school community. I think of you and him as a somebody who uses machine reading, so I hope you sort of find things you could be using for whatever it is you're doing. Um, but I also would hope you could innovate and help us solving a lot of the problems that we have currently in machine reading, of which there are quite a bit. Um, as much as news will try and tell you otherwise. So in this talk, I'll first start with um, text for symbolic representations. So this is a relatively, I'd say, traditional topic. People still work on this quite a bit, but it certainly isn't as, um, as hip as the end-to-end -end question answering, which Johannes, in a previous instantiation of this, this tutorial, uh, would talk about, but uh, because he's not around, I'll try that as well. Um, so, and then in the third part of the presentation, I will just talk about current trends in machine reading and open problems that we have. All right, I'll start with text to symbolic representations, or this idea of mapping text to a knowledge graph of sorts. Before I go there, I'd like to just give a few things or describe a few things that I think a representation needs to have. Like it should be easy to use when you retrieve information. Um, it should normalize the information in the sense that um, if there are several ways of expressing the same thing, the knowledge representation should represent them in the same way uh, because that will make it easier to ask 
for that information in different ways and receiving it even though you ask for it in different ways. You should generally cover a lot of things in that knowledge representation. It shouldn't be too specific unless that's exactly what you want to do. It should be making it easy for you to engineer and work with that representation. So the graphs I'll talk about, uh, computer scientists like those because they're really used to working with graphs. Uh, it should support some form of reasoning. So when you extract knowledge from text and you get, for example, this graph, like you should be able to infer new knowledge that wasn't explicitly stated in the text, but you could infer based on logical reasoning. So like a, a simple trivial example is if somebody says that A is the son of B and B is the son of C, then why it isn't said in the text that A is the grandson of C, uh, you should be able to infer that. And a good representation makes that easy. And generally, you don't want it to take up too much space. To get there from that language, there are a couple of issues you need to address. Like, first is the ambiguity of language. And I'm sure you heard about that as a general problem within <laughs> this, uh, this summer, summer school a bit. I, that's one of the fundamental issues when you process language, that the same, say, word can mean several things in different contexts. And getting your algorithms to deal with that is one of the, the main issues. There's the dual problem of that, which is variation. You can say the same thing in many ways. And uh, in order to map text to a unified, normalized representation, you need to understand that variation. Um, then there's the problem of co-reference, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. If you have a pronoun, you have to figure out where does that pronoun belong to. And that's actually one of the hardest NLP problems still today. Um, that uh, in order to build these representations and to really understand what the knowledge is in that text, you need to get right. Uh, and then you have to deal with the scale of information. So generally, um, you can't just uh, assume you just have a single text. You have large amounts of text. And reading all of that text will change the way that you approach that problem. <coughs> all right, so in comes knowledge graph construction. The name of the game here is to get, as mentioned, from text to this graph that represents sort of what happens in that graph. And we're gonna do this in a few steps. Um, and I'm gonna formalize that a little just to make a point later. Um, there will be a process here going from the text to the representation. Uh, and this process I'll just call R. And then there's a process that goes from the representation and the question to the answer. And I call that A. Here I'm gonna focus actually just on on this bit for now, but I'll talk a little about that step as well, which isn't strictly machine reading as such, but it's, it's very important to understand. Now let's look at this construction itself. The first thing you wanna do is extracting and typing the entities in that text. So we have this text, and uh, in that text there are a few entities, namely Tesla, Gos Gospic, and Prague. Um, and Tesla here is a person, Gospic is a location, and so is Prague. And when I say sequence labeling, I mean that we can formalize this problem as the task of just producing a sequence of, of labels. Um, and you have heard about sequence labeling before. Pretty much everything you learned there, you know here as well. Uh, you can apply here as well. Just to give you a sense though, um, traditionally people have done this with what's called conditional uh, random fields. Um, today the field has moved on to some form of uh, RNNs, probably transformer at this time. I, so the things, like the field has been changing so fast uh, that it's a little difficult to, um, to keep up. I, uh, I will say, I will tell you this, like, there are certainly things in here that aren't uh, state of the art anymore, but the general nature of things actually hasn't changed that much. So uh, it's important to understand, I think, the, the general architecture of these things, whether it's a transformer or a bias TM or a linear chain model. Uh, I don't think that's the most important part of what I'm trying to get across. Um, what you actually find is that for a lot of tasks, 
uh, for a lot of uh, NER problems, or this is named entity recognition and typing problems, uh, people use a hybrid of um, recurrent neural networks and conditional random fields. And I'll talk a little about that in the next slide. Again, feel free to ask when you have any open question. So the core challenge, or one of the core challenges you have to address implicitly or explicitly when you <laughs> deal with named entity recognition and this kind of sequence labeling task is the ambiguity. For example, Tesla here, if you don't know the context, might be a brand, a car brand, or it might be a person. So your entity typing model needs to understand the context in order to figure out the right type for this. And the way this is done is, as I mentioned, using a first, like just plain linear chain of uh, say a conditional random field. Here I use this factor graph notation. Who, who knows factor graphs? Probably very few. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much depth because that's pretty much the only slide I have factor graphs on. Um, but I'll try to give you the gist. So basically here are these small functions or potential functions that measure how much do I like an O and an O following each other. Or how much do I like an O and a P. O is no label, P is person. How much do I like those two guys following each other? And if they follow each other, I give it a high score maybe, and if they don't follow each other, then I give it a low score. This, this black box here means there is a function like that. Likewise, here's a function that says, oh, for this particular token here, I really like a P. I give you 10.5 if you're a P. I only give you minus two if you're an O. And uh, traditional sequence labeling has been focusing on learning these kind of functions and then at test time figuring out what is the highest scoring uh, sequence of labels with respect to these mini functions that assess the transitions and the individual labels. And then you use Viterbi, which I think you have also learned about to find that high scoring sequence. So that's pretty much all the same. The interesting bit about the work in, in this area is that the way that people parameterize these local potentials, the way that you calculate the way whether you like a P or not, is in this case conditioned on an RNN. Uh, in particular, there's a vector here that you learned to map to a score for a P or a score for an O. And this vector representation of the token Tesla is informed by what's happening after that token. So I'm gonna take the representation of uncles, the, uh, then produce a representation of S, and then based on that, produce a representation of Tesla. And I do the same thing uh, from the other direction. And hence, while I'm calculating whether this is a good P or not, I'm using the forward and reverse context, and then can figure out that this Tesla actually, because there is persons and uncles here, uh, because of that, I, uh, I know this is a person and not a brand. And then you do pretty much everything like that for the other things. Oh, the input, and you have also learned about word embeddings and RNN, so I'm not gonna talk too much about this right now. I'll repeat a bit about that later. But anyway, you feed these, these vector representation initially with word representations of the input tokens. And you do that for pretty much all your potentials here, and then you have your hybrid CRF RNN. And as far as I know, that is still state of the art in, uh, in any R. If you know better, just let me know. Um, all right, so, so that's the first step. You have labeled these mentions with the entity types they belong to. Now we can essentially start building that graph because each of these mentions might correspond to one node. Some of them might correspond to the same node, but we'll address that issue later. Um, you can also populate nodes in that graph using the pronouns in this, uh, in this text. Um, and we'll see how we connect these pronouns later on. Because obviously this pronoun here belongs to this guy. Uh, and we'll address that in a bit. Now once you have 
these, these nodes, these quite text-bound nodes, you can ask how are these nodes related to each other based on the information in the text. Uh, for example, we try to figure out, I hope this is readable, the green isn't very clear, at least from my perspective. So that says move to. Uh, so here there is a relation expressed that is the move to relation. And if you want to build that graph, you want to extract that relation. And then populate your graph with it. The way this is handled in practice is essentially through neural classifiers today and something that's called distance supervision, which I'll briefly talk about. <coughs> Notice that so far I have sort of produced a meaning representation in two steps. First I did the entity extraction and typing, then I did the relation extraction. The sequence of steps will get longer and longer, and that's one of the core issues I'll talk about later. All right, one of the challenges you have to deal with in relation extraction, but also across the board, is variation. And just to bring that message home, uh, in this particular case, there are several ways to represent or express the fact that A moved to B, like uh, he actually moved to B, or he settled in B. All of these are essentially valid ways to express that fact. And if you want to extract these relations, you have to capture all of those. The way this can be done is through neural networks, um, which for example might look like this. So this is work from 2015. Again, I don't think the structure of the work has changed much, but I think this is easier to explain. Um, so if you're given a sentence with marked entity mentions in that sentence, like Kojo Anan and Kofi Anan, um, then first, as it is pretty much always the case, you map those tokens to their word embeddings. Uh, in addition, you add to the actual representation a position indication. And this position indication will capture the distance of that token from the first and the second entity mentioned in that text. So if this was the distance from the first entity mentioned, what would be the value here? Yeah, okay, that's too easy, sorry. Like, I, I always get these wrong. Um, so uh, if they're too easy, just say, and, and we all, and I, I get embarrassed, but that's fine. Um, I, I wait about like 10 seconds usually, and then I'll just, just say it. Anyway, there's a zero here, there's a zero here, there's a one there, there's probably a minus one there. So that's a way to capture in that representation where relative to the actual mentions that you care about, the token is. And that's crucial, if you don't do this, this won't work. Because there's also no reason to, uh, for, for the model to know that you're actually asking for the relation between these two things if you don't indicate that in the representation, right? And so you need to have that position representation, even if it's just for the purpose of saying, that guy with a zero here is the first argument. That guy with a zero here is the second argument. But capturing that position also in here means you can relate or establish the importance of these tokens as well, implicitly, through that, impl uh, through that representation. All right, so you have learned about convolutions, right? Um, so um, next, you do a convolution over those. For example, the sort of bigram uh, convolution that looks at, say, two or three tokens consecutively and then combines them. And you have several convolution filters, let's say three in this case. One of the things about convolution in this context is that they do this so-called piecewise convolution where you have in a particular channel of the convolution, you essentially have, sorry, you have um, three parts. You have the part that corresponds to 
everything after the second entity, everything first uh, before the first entity, and everything in between. Now, when you do the pooling on top of that representation, you do it on a per segment uh, basis. So this guy here is max pooling over everything in the part after the second entity. This guy is max pooling everything here, and this guy is max pooling everything here. And you do that for every channel. So first channel is here, concatenate that with the second channel and the third channel. And then that's your representation of this particular instance with respect to this guy being the first entity and this guy being the second entity. Then you have a softmax classifier that takes that representation and just maps it to the label space that you have. Yeah? Can you repeat how you use the position uh, vector? How you compute the position vector? Yeah. So um, let's say the first four guys here are just the uh, word vector vectors, whatever. Uh, this guy is the distance from mention one. So in this case, it will be zero here because mention one is just zero away. Here you would have minus one. Here you might have minus two, etc. The different ways of representing that actual distance, but more or less that's what's capturing. Do you do this for every pair of lines? Yes. So exactly. So so actually, and that that's a crucial point. Uh, when you run this, you essentially run this model for every pair of entities that you have in the sentence, uh, which is somewhat expensive. And I think there should be ways of pooling a bit of that uh, computation. But because the representations here depend on what entity pair you're looking at, it's not obvious how you share information across these, these entities. Yeah? Can you explain what are the labels? The labels here? Yeah, good point. Um, so label one might be move to, label two might be son of, uh, label three might be works for. Uh, Label five might be no label at all. Like, they're not related in, in, in the relation that we care about. So that's the label space in this case. So you have a closed list of relations? That's correct. Um, which actually is a bottleneck in, in many cases. Like thinking about all the relations you want to model and thinking about this ahead of time is, is actually an engineering uh, challenge uh, that you will spend a lot of time on if you work in this space. Yeah? Um, as in, can you give an example? What do you mean by that? Like you have, sorry, yeah, I'm trying to, it's hard always with these things to come up with recall, to think of the examples on top of your head. Oh, I know. But as in if you have like an example of a relation, yeah. but that relation entails another relation within the same span of, oh, so, I so see. now the issue is you have to classify it, but you might have more than one classification then. So you have within a span, or within a relation, another relation that's entailed within your list of relations? Yes. Uh, that's relations. a great question. I, I, I want to take that offline because okay. I, I think it gets a bit more technical. We're, we're dealing with something similar. It'd be great to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, catch me, catch me later today. Um, Oh, 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 okay, so th that, that might not be exactly what you meant, but maybe it is. But I think that's also, that's a good, that, that is also a good question. Um, and uh, that's, that's often referred as multi-label relation extraction. So you have, for one entity, several possible labels, sorry, for one entity pair, several possible labels. Uh, in which case, this guy cannot be a softmax, uh, which assumes there's only one, one guy, uh, one relation. And you have like several sigmoids here, for example, that say, yeah, that, that is that relation, yes, that's that relation, no, it's not that relation. So that you can do if you essentially, on a high level, just replace this guy with, soft, sorry, <laughs> sigmoids, with like five sigmoids. Um, I think you had something slightly else, but I don't wanna uh, go into too much depth, um, just because I think that, that's an interesting but also quite technical uh, issue. Um, okay, so, yeah, no, I like it, uh, go ahead, you. but also for the inverse pair of relation, right? Because instead of minus one, you need plus one, et cetera. For the inverse relation, you mean when 
Uh, if you consider first the first coyo and then the, and then coffee, or if you consider first coffee and then coyo, you have instead yeah, of that's uh, that, that's that's correct. Uh, so, so you, you actually you do both directions and you run it again separately. Okay, um, so you have two position vectors for every pair of relation one for uh, first and second and then second and third. Yes, although they they used in different in different runs essentially. Like when you like you classify one entity pair with direction. One two, and then sort of separately, you classify two one. Okay. Like that that happens in in two different forward passes of the same model, but with different inputs. Okay, um. thank you. All right, Sebastian, we are still talking about intrasentential relations. Eh? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's the point that we need to emphasize here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that is intra. Uh, that is intrasentential. Although in this framework, nothing stops you from doing that across sentences, I don't think it would work very well, partly because, well, because of many reasons. But uh, there was one more, and then I really move on. Yes. In different sentences, so the, the question was basically that, how, how to solve that problem? Is this the model also for that case? Uh, how to solve the problem of, of longer? Yes, of so relations that are um, implicit and distributed across uh, yeah. sentences. Yeah. So partly you can address this problem through coreference in the sense that, okay. in the sense that um, if the relation is expressed through a pronoun in one sentence, um, so, so say, you know, he, like, Sebastian studied in London, uh, in Edinburgh. He, uh, he was born in Hamburg. Then, uh, you know, I can, I can link Sebastian to Hamburg through the process of co-referencing he to, to Sebastian. So that's one way. But then there is uh, there, there are actual relations that, that cross sentences that aren't based on co-reference, which are quite tricky. Uh, in which case, I can, I can you know, come up with a model for that, and there is work that does that actually in the biological, uh, biomedical area, which I can point you to later if you're interested in that. The problem with that isn't so much the modeling, the problem with that is more the fact that annotating that data and getting enough training data for it is a bit hard because these relations are more rare and harder to, uh, for humans to, to label. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about that offline actually um, and point you to that paper. And I think that's all. Um, Pune et al. in 2017 or 18. Um, okay, so what I haven't talked about is the fact that you need to train this, uh, this model, and in a way you can train this easily, right? I mean, it's a classifier, softmax classifier. Uh, you're just given a couple of sentences together with, or marked sentences with entity one and entity two, together with a label at the other end and say, well, maximize your cross entropy or whatnot. Um, so that's, that's fine. Um, in reality though, that process of annotating sentences, like sentence by sentence, is somewhat expensive and doesn't scale that well. And in fact, in many cases, it isn't really strictly necessary. Uh, and this is where what, what's called distance supervision comes into play. So you might have several Right. You might have several mentions of the same entity pair in different contexts. Some of them which express the same relation, um, some of which don't. So I have no idea whether that, that's probably not true at all. So that, this is like completely hypothetical. This is just the only example I could come up with. Um, so there are different, different ways of describing these two mentions or these two entities in different contexts. And what we have is this bag of mentions or bag of sentences. And what we have on top of that is in this resource called Wikidata or DBpedia, these are public resources of, um, of triples of subject, predicate, <coughs> objects um, that say who is related to whom. 
and, and which organization you know, employs which other person, et cetera. So we can use that data and we can use it as an annotation. Um, in a way, that means we don't exactly know what the labels on the individual um, <coughs> sentences are, but we can hope that our model can sort of learn how to make these individual label predictions and then aggregate them to this label. And hopefully by doing that, it would actually learn which things I should care about and which I shouldn't. So generally, there is a broader per entity pair, and in this case, um, so per entity pair softmax classifier that says for Kojo and Kofi, uh, independent of the sentences, I know they're in the son of relationship. And then there's a pooling operation that takes all of these vectors and puts them together into one representation. And then at training time, you just use the label that you have in the knowledge base and backpropagate back through that pooling operation into the individual sentences. And then likewise into the representations. And that's how these representations learn how to distinguish between different types of relation. So, this has been like a, a very um, fruitful way of, of approaching relation extraction, purely because often when you try to predict or populate a knowledge base, you already have parts of that knowledge base. And because you have that part, partial knowledge base, you can use it to actually supervise your model. So that's a very powerful way to get around costly per sentence annotation. All right, let's talk about co-reference cool resolution. Um, so as I mentioned, right now you have a pronoun here that's sort of dangling in that graph. And we know this pronoun moved to Prague, but we don't yet know that this pronoun actually belongs to Tesla. Figuring out these links and collapsing these nodes is what's called um, co-reference resolution. And I give you a, again, quite high-level overview of a current neural architecture that uh, does this type of uh, co-reference. And this is based on Kenton Lee's 2017 work. Again, you have your favorite bias CM, which takes as input word vectors representing the tokens that go into the sentence. The model is actually separated or divided into, I'd say, two parts. One part produces a representation for each possible mention phrase, like span in the text, that we then like to link to each other in a second step. So in the first step, the only thing we're doing is we're trying to represent spans using low dimensional vectors. And we do this, as I said, by first passing all of these tokens through a bias TM to get contextualized per token representation at the end. Now, we have a heuristic that produces all the possible candidate spans of some length, let's say up to three. And then for each of these candidate spans, we do two things. First, we take the representation of the first token in that candidate span, namely general in this case, um, and concatenate it to the final output re representation of that span. Then we take the last token of that um, phrase and concatenate it with the final representation and then we take a combination uh, using an intention mechanism, a combination of the representations of all the tokens in that span and uh, also add that to the representation. The reason for this last step is that what you try to learn here is a way to find the, what's called the syntactic head of the phrase, the thing that, that defines its syntactic uh, constituency. And uh, this usually is a really good feature for co-reference, right? So if you have a longer phrase, uh, like, I mean, even take a shorter phrase, like the company, the 
word company certainly is important um, to link this word against other things. The word <coughs> the, not so much. And in this case, the syntactic head would be company. And so you want to have a way to figure out that uh, syntactic head. But instead of doing that using a syntactic parser, an actual sort of trained beast that you had to prepare and, and you know, configure for your language, which might not be English, uh, here they learn essentially the headedness of a phrase just by using the co-reference data, which is a powerful way of, of capturing this, this issue. All right, so then you have representation for the phrase. And uh, there are two things you do with that representation. A, you predict whether that representation at all is a mention. Like, is, is it an actual thing that people mention and that could be co-referring uh, with another phrase in the sentence? Or is it just a span? Uh, to give you an example, electric say the isn't really a grammatical uh, constituent. It's not a phrase. It's not a mention of anything. It's just a span. So the mention score of this guy would be quite low, whereas General Electric is a proper noun phrase referring to a company. So perfect mention score. This guy should have a high score. Uh, the reason that we're trying to predict this is because in the next step, we can essentially ignore all of the phrases that have a low mention score, which means that instead of looking at a quadratic number of all of the possible mentions that we could come up with in a whole document, we only need to look at a small subset of those. So that's what the mention score is good for. Yeah? Said electric said the what? The third uh, trigram shouldn't be said the postal instead the postal service. You mean this guy? No, no, the, uh, that, that one, yes. The postal service? It should be. Oh, you mean, like, so, okay, this list is not complete. It's just like a, a subset of the uh, uh -huh. candidate phrases to make it readable in a way. So, so if, if you actually print all of the possible spans here, uh, this would soon blow up. Uh, mm. So, but you're completely right. Like, there would be many more phrases and that wouldn't be the next one. That's mm. true. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right, so, so now we have these mentioned representations and we have these mentioned scores. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a particular phrase and we try to figure out which other phrase does it co-refer to? And we're doing that by, um, for example, taking the representation of the company. <coughs> this is the phrase we're trying to link to another phrase. And um, first, we calculate, based on the representation of, say, say, the postal service, a score that matches how, that, that captures how likely these things are uh, antecedents of each other, or how, how likely this is an antecedent of this guy. And, uh, we do that for every possible candidate phrase that has a high enough mention score, right? So the electric and the postal service, they both get a score by combining or comparing this vector to this vector or this vector to this vector, producing that number. Um, now, this number is actually combined with the mention score of the corresponding uh, mentions. So if this guy is not a mention, but we somehow have you know, kept it in our filtering step, then in this final score, this is gonna be reflected. So that maybe this, this phrase looks a lot like it could be an antecedent of this, sorry, the other way around. This guy could be linked to this guy, but actually this guy might not be a, a mention at all. So in this, at this point, we're actually combining the mention scores and the pairwise mention scores for one score. And then we have a score that says how likely the company uh, is linked to General Electric. And here is one that mentions, that, that captures how likely the company is linked to the Postal Service. 
And then finally, so this gives us two values here, we also need to figure out how likely is the company a completely new mention, uh, sorry, a new entity introduced at this point in the text, and uh, this is the score here. And pretty much then you have your co-reference. Yeah? So I mentioned here, and for example, you several uh, here. So why they use a softmax function rather than multiple sigmoid for each antecedent oh, yeah, relation? Oh, yeah, that's a Yes. Um, so because here it's like a yeah. multi-label classification. Not yeah, the that's right. Um, so what happens is that it's true that generally um, one... One mention here can have several antecedents that are all sort of corresponding to the same entity. Right? Mm -hmm. Rather than predicting all of them, what these models do is they, they learn to choose one of them. Even though we don't have that annotation generally in the data, um, they're forced to predict one of those. So there's sort of like a latent variable problem here where you, you need to choose sort of through the training objective a particular, um, a particular antecedent that is best or most representative for that particular uh, mention that you're trying to link. So, you know, but your, yeah. but you, your, da your data set doesn't allow you to do that because your labels are one or zero for each antecedent. Yeah, so that's so right. Like the, the data set doesn't yeah. have that information. That's why it's a latent, uh, latent yeah, yeah, yeah. problem. That's right. Um, okay. so, so in the actual model, you don't use... Um, you don't have a strict signal on what is the right one. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah, so th that's, that's correct. Yeah? So this is more of a practical question, yeah. but you know, in practice, you will need to do name entity recognition, right? So, you know, in, in, in a practical application, right? Like, so is the idea that you would like use the other model to do name entity recognition and then this kind of model to do co-reference and then kind of join the two, and if not, why not just use, you know, if you already have the entities that you're going to recognize, then why not use those as yeah. candidates yeah. rather than going through every, you know, because it's obviously yeah. computationally. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, so notice that, like, first of all, not all of the mentions that you're linking are actually named entities. Yeah. So, so the company isn't. Um, that's true. So they, they, they could be good. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think, yeah, you're completely right. It would be good to inform the core reference system uh, with the entity mentions that you predicted in the first step. That's kind of how I presented it. But if you look at this work, for example, they don't really use an NER system as a um, pre-step to this computation. Um, and I, I think generally this is because A, I feel a lot of the research along this whole pipeline, generally, feels very isolated. So there's this interesting thing where like, each of these steps that I presented to you, they became sort of problems by themselves and there's like a whole subfield that works on it. They kind of like work in isolation, I feel. Um, and, and they make good progress on these benchmark data sets, but then when you end up putting these things together, it's actually not necessarily working that well. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a problem. Um, and I'll talk about that a little. Oh, yeah, 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 no. Yeah, we, we, can, we can have a, a long discussion about whether I think we should actually still be doing this. Um, I, although at least, and, and I had uh, interesting discussions yesterday with, uh, with somebody who's actually working on, on co-reference here, who knows much more about this. Um, and I, I think there's been amazing progress, but the problem is so hard, and uh, it's partly because it requires things like common sense to, to address it. Like, just to give you an example, here, this is like a, a, a standard, a classical common sense uh, co-reference issue, right? Where I say, the trophy would not fit into the brown suitcase because it was too big. Now, because it was too big, you know it has to be the trophy, not the suitcase. But if it was too small, it would need to be the suitcase. Like understanding that really requires a level of uh, knowledge 
that uh, models by themselves don't necessarily have. That said, uh, remarkably, like with uh, Elmo and Bert and, and these sort of pre-trained language models, things have changed quite a bit, and I think they're getting a little at that knowledge. Um, but that, that's not really a answering your question. Um, I think I haven't, let me put it this way, I haven't seen many successful industry applications of coreference. And that might be A, because it is difficult and, and the precision, a precision you can get quite high if you, if you do it well, but then the recall is not that good, um, is, is not so good. And because it's also like a thing that people have done in isolation, but the minute you com combine it with all the other things you do, it's going to leave you with cascading errors and, and things like that. So it's, I think it's a really interesting problem for understanding language processing and, and language understanding. Um, practically, I, I'm not so convinced that we're yet there, but m maybe we will. Um, all right, um, um, one thing I have seen in practice um, I yeah, have sorry. One, one more question. Yeah. Um, a few slides before, you have introduced a model for relation extraction. Yes. And it, it looked very simple. Yeah. And uh, the model for co-reference resolution is, uh, looks more complicated. And uh, my question is, is it possible to use the relation extraction model for co-reference resolution? Or vice versa? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think you're right. Um, so I, I think the general structure of that sorry, relation extraction model, sort of taking essentially two mentions and then representing them in context. It's kind of the information you need for a co-reference decision as well. Um, so I think in, in, in theory and in practice you can do that. I'm not sure if it would work that well. Some of the complexity from the model in co-reference stems from the fact that you have to predict these um, these mention scores in order to filter out candidates. So that's something that I think you really want to capture in order to speed up the whole inference process. Um, notice that the relation extraction, as we discussed, kind of works on a sentence level, whereas the co-reference um, prediction works on the whole document level, right? Which means that a lot of what works in sentence level in terms of complexity doesn't work in um, on the, on the whole document level. And while you're right that the complexity of the relation extractor as, as a model itself is lower than the complexity of the, um, of the co-reference model, the co-reference model is clever in the way that it cuts, out the, cuts down the, uh, the search space later on. And that's something you would need to capture. But I mean, let's look at it. Um, it is not that much more complicated. The, the main thing that is more, com more complicated is the fact that you have this bio STM layer here. Uh, and then you have a bit of attention here. But I, I don't know whether that is more complicated than a convolutional neural network. I, I think it's up to debate. Like I, I don't know how you classify. No, uh, the, the next slide is more complicated. <laughs> the next slide is more yeah. complicated. Yeah. yeah, this one, yeah. Yeah, well. I, like maybe that is, that is relative or subjective. I, I, but I, I think I'm, there is more stuff going on here. I, I agree with that. Um, and, but I think partly that, that stuff is going on because of that uh, pre-filtering step and the fact that we reuse the score. If, if we didn't reuse those scores, then this bit here would look really sim simple. It would just be going from here to here and then there. Actually, it would be very simple. I could, if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw this like in, 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 yeah, in, in, a, in a second. Uh, and, and it would look really simple. Um, so, but I do think that the complexity stems from, from these guys. Okay, thank you. Actually, just when, when is the lunch break? Half past 12. All right, uh, there was one more question. I'll, I'll take them as they come. Yeah. How do you, say again? So the mention score here is just a, a function of the span representation, right? There is some kind of uh, linear or nonlinear. I wouldn't know right now from the top of my head. Like mapping from this score, from this representation, like a linear mapping, I'd imagine, to a mention score, right? So there's some matrix here. 
that takes the input uh, representation and turns it into a, sorry, not, not even matrix, it's just a vector in this case. It's a vector that turns that into a, uh, into a score. So a dot product, for example. I, I, I have to say, I don't know it right now from the top of my head. So this is at a high level hand waving. In your, in your data set, you have only the, the loss is computed only on the, on the panel layer, right? You don't have in your data set what's a mention and what's not a mention. I, in a way, you have that information. It's the, um, the data set has mentions of things related to other mentions of things. So the, the, the things that aren't in that data set, they are non-mentions in a way. But I, uh, let, me, uh, let me look that up uh, more closely and then get back to you. Singleton mentions, yeah, that's so you don't point. have a label for yeah. each mention if it's a mention or, or not. Yeah, so, so, so what they did both, is, yeah. is they, they use the, um, the coreference decision score between spans and, and they backpack backpack propagated the score, the, the loss to, to learn also oh, the see. mention score. So they don't have a loss here, they just back propagate it. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, thanks. Yes then I really want to move on. Uh, as I understand, uh, the, anti uh, the antecedent score in this model yeah. is just a local function. Uh, I mean... Uh, is, is what function? Is that a local function. I mean, the function just care about only two, uh, only two mentions. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, it's difficult to, to find the, the uh, coreference link between uh, uh, two mentions that's uh, far from each other, and even with uh, the second paper, they try to improve this uh, model. I don't remember the title. Uh, high order, uh, high order correlation, oh yeah, 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 right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, he tried to improve uh, yeah. this function, this local function, but mm, uh, uh, I tried to train the second model, yeah. but mm, uh, on a Russian data set. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, uh, the performance is uh, not really good. Do you have any idea to improve? Uh, I, I mean, um, um, you know, it's a like long-term dependency. When you try to fit uh, a long document into the model, so uh, it's... Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I probably not so much. But what I can say is that I mean, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that while it is a local decision, there is a representation going into that local decision that has, in theory, seen the whole document, right? So, mm -hmm. um, be because the BIOSTM that feeds the mention representation is actually, if you had enough training data, right, it would be able to, to pick up that, that long distance relation. Um, it doesn't, like, and, and I, I don't disagree with that. Like, that's really hard. But one thing I'd imagine to work better, and I, I do believe that uh, Lee et al. have done this this year, is if you replace this with a transformer, uh, where you're much better at uh, at getting long distance relationships, um, because the reformer doesn't have that recency bias, you actually you actually do much better. So that that might be one way to go about it. Uh, but that's just me saying, why don't you try BERT, which, which is, is good advice, but uh, it's probably also not that, that interesting. Um, but I, I also don't know how, how your data sets are. Uh, is, is it a standard data set? Is uh, it I tried to train uh, on Russian data sets with uh, uh, one sample. You know, it's, uh, it's like one document with uh, maybe 50 sentences. So it's uh, very difficult. Uh, it's very long sentences. Uh, yeah. Sorry, long documents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we should we should take that offline, um, and so, thank you. move forward. All right. So finally, you have this task of entity <coughs> linking, which is essentially saying, okay, now I have these different mentions of Tesla in different documents, and I want to make sure that they all link to the right single Tesla entity, as opposed to assuming every time you read a new document about Tesla, that creates a new entity in my graph, meaning that I cannot really unify information. So we want to figure out that uh, 
I guess this Tesla and this Tesla, they are not linking together, but this Tesla and this Tesla, they should be collapsed together. And that's what the entity linking process does. Um, note that at this point we have done these sort of one, two, three, four, four steps uh, to get to this graph. Um, very brief, and I'll, I'll keep this, I think this, this is a, a easier architecture to, to, uh, to swallow, and I'll keep this very short. Um, so if you want to link mentions to entities, the way you do this by and large is by representing somehow the mentions using a dense vector and representing the entities with a dense vector, and then heuristically usually find all the candidate entities that you could link with a particular mention, for example, using a dictionary of sorts, uh, or looking at the training data and see how often a particular thing, like India, a particular uh, phrase, was linked to a particular entity, and then use that information to come up with candidate in entities. So India, in this case, could be India the country, or it could be India the cricket team, for example. Uh, and so, in your training set, you find all of these possible links to India, and then you decide which of them it is by representing the entity and by representing the, the mention, and then seeing how well that uh, representation fits. Um, so for example, uh, if you look at the mention of India in this context, the first thing you do is you represent it in context using, say, an LSTM or BiSTM. Um, that gives you a somewhat local representation of that, um, of that mention. Local in the sense that while, again, actually you have, in theory, access to every possible uh, token through the LSTM, you're actually not so good at remembering what's really far away. Um, so that's sort of a local representation. And uh, you combine that local representation with a global but unordered bag of word representation. So you look at the document and uh, you represent the document as a sort of one hot vector and then just uh, linear project that into a dense representation uh, that gives you a sense of the topic of that document without necessarily understanding how that mention directly embeds in that, uh, in that document, which isn't so important. Let's just make sure that in this case, for example, if that's the India cricket team, uh, that will be represented in, uh, in, this, in this bag of mentions representation because there's a cricket cup in here. If it was India the country, it might not be in there. So that's the first step. You represent the mention, and then you represent the um, entity. And the way you do that is by taking the entity description and uh, using, in this case, uh, in the case of Gupta et al. 2017 work, you use a CNN to map that description down to an entity description, a dense entity representation. And now we have these two vectors, this guy and this guy, and you compare them, say, to a dot product. And if there's a high score, if they're uh, collinear, then uh, there's a link, otherwise there isn't. So that's more or less the entity linking game. All right, so that's pretty much the pipeline. Um, and again, and as this question came up, I've showed you these things as things you do sort of one by another and then you combine them. In reality, I've seen very little work that actually goes through the whole length. They, but they all make that point, like they would write a paper and be like, you know, like um, relation extraction is extremely important, you know, this, uh, but then it isn't really. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm saying this, I, I've done relation extraction for a long time. I, I think it's a great topic and I, I do think it's ultimately uh, really useful and it will be, but uh, it's just a matter of fact that uh, this is how the field is, is um, operating. I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think that's how we have to do it in some way or another. Uh, anyway, I, I get not, enough of that. Um, I think these representations have a lot of strength. Um, people understand really quite well how to do reasoning, like logical reasoning in these graph representations. Like prolog essentially uh, is operating on these, these triples or tuples. And you, know, you can make a lot of interesting inferences on top of this. Uh, and we understand how that works. Uh, it's 
it's a very fast data structure to access, like when you have your query, like browsing through a graph, looking at the neighbors and all that can be really fast and useful if that's what you want to do. Um, there is there's generalization or normalization, like several things are mapped to the same representation, which is great. There's this uniform uh, nature to it. It's interpretable and people like that phrase a lot, so you can look at it and uh, you kind of know what the machine has learned and what it has read. And if it's wrong, you can fix it. So that's really, really useful. Um, and it's not the case with what I'll talk about later. Um, and then because you have these existing knowledge bases often for many of the tasks that you want to do, you can use them as training signal for what you do there. So that's very convenient. Um, and it's to be contrasted with having databases of questions and answers for your tasks, which you might not have as easily as a database. Um, talk about that later. So that's great. Um, one core challenge is essentially cascading errors in the sequence of steps. So you make an error in entity um, typing and extraction. Uh, you can't really recover from that in entity linking uh, or in well, in co-reference, if you were to do this as a pipeline, and if you actually were to do it in the real world, uh, you wouldn't be able to recover from it. Uh, and the same essentially holds throughout the, the whole pipeline. So these errors multiply, making the accuracy of these, these graphs not so good. Or they make them really good, but then the precision is high, but the recall will be really low. And what you end up finding in that knowledge base is essentially just uh, the things you knew already. So uh, that's, that's a big challenge. This challenge gets, when you actually look at question answering with natural questions, gets magnified even more so because in order to answer a question like what city did Tesla move to in AT, AT uh, using the knowledge graph, you have to map that question to a logical representation of that question as well. And this is what's called semantic parsing of questions. So that's yet another source of error. Uh, so if you want to answer this question and you really want to do this, uh, you probably have errors here and uh, you have errors here uh, and, and errors everywhere. So, so in, in fact, I don't see this sort of whole end-to-end -end natural language and natural language, natural language question, natural language text to answer thing using this paradigm that much because of that uh, cascading error problem and other issues. So that's one issue. Um, I think another issue that I find essentially even um, more bothersome is the fact that to come up with the perfect representation that represents all the knowledge that you need, that's a pretty hard task and likely going to fail. You're going to start like thinking about, oh, these are the relations we need, these are the types we laid, and then like, I don't know, like a week later realize, oh, that didn't quite fit the way that I actually used this data, oh, that's not good, and then you have like, uh, meetings and meetings of, sort of with people who all need to agree on this representation uh, and uh, you know people can spend can can spend weeks and sort of coming up with the right ontology for what you what you care about uh, that's that's actually I think a major po pain point from from my experience um, it's also somewhat harder to annotate when you have to do it. So let's say you've gone through the effort of coming up with the perfect ontology in your head, the perfect schema of relations, and uh, you all agree, and now you have to tell this to annotators, and, and they have to get what you mean. Uh, so you give them these guidelines, and you tell them, like, come up with this graph structure if I give you this text. And they would certainly get it wrong. They have a different interpretation of it, and it's gonna be an expensive and slow process to gen generate the training data you need to do this. So um, that's another challenge. I, I realize I come across as too negative about this. Actually, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's that bad, but these are the problems of it. Um, and uh, sorry, in contrast, actually giving annotators questions and text and then letting them come up with answers is actually usually much cheaper because real humans don't think in terms of graphs and uh, relations and, and logic, right? They like language and that's something they can actually do. So what you find is that there's a lot of work that just creates annotations in this space, even to just produce the actual annotation here. So there's some work that formulates knowledge base annotation as a process of question answering for the annotator, which they then map to the knowledge graph, just because 
that's an easier thing to do. Uh, so one question is, is there, is there a different way? And uh, the answer is yes, there is a different way, um, which is don't go through that immediate meaning representation uh, and, and don't manually engineer the schema of that. Damn it. Rather sort of learn one function end to end that takes the question, the text, and then produces the answer. And as I mentioned, because this kind of annotation is a bit cheaper, we can actually hope to build end-to-end -end deep learning models that can learn this behavior from it. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Uh, let's look at end-to-end -end question answering. End-to-end -end question answering, uh, most of the research in the last couple of years has been driven by this data set called the Stanford Question Answering Data Set. I think, um, or, or squad. This data set had a tremendous impact on the field. Um, it's pretty much um, the most used data set in what I, I think right now NLP, at, at least in recent years, is my impression. Um, and the data set pretty much looks like this. Uh, you have given text passages, and you have questions, and you have answers. Now what's important to understand is that the way this data set was created was such that you gave the text to an annotator and then you ask them to come up both with the question and the answer. And that creates a particular bias. Um, that means that when you actually have real questions um, that aren't driven by you thinking about what is a good question for this text, then the models that we learn from this data aren't necessarily the best for that. So there, there have been new data sets called, for example, natural questions by Google that address this, but for now let's focus on this. Um, so given a paragraph and a question about it, predict the text span that states the correct answer. There are about 100,000 examples in this data set, which is quite massive if you compare it to the data sets we have for the task that I showed you in the first part of the talk. Uh, and again, this comes from the fact that it is relatively simple for humans to produce this kind of annotation. Uh, also, Stanford has, has money, but I think uh, it's actually not that expensive. It's widely used, and the task is extractive, and that's crucial here. The answers, they have to be spans in the text. You're not asking the model to come up with a new answer with a new text that it hasn't been seen. Uh, it has to be an answer in the text, which limits the kind of reasoning that uh, a model would have to do in order to come up with the answer. Most of the time you're doing some form of pattern matching of the question and the area around the text, uh, area around the answer um, that matches that question. Note that there are other forms of QA, um, like free form answer generation, which I think is still quite a bit away, uh, and then multiple choice, which is much easier, but often like, a little too easy. Um, just to give you a sense of all the data sets that have emerged in the last couple of years in QA. I think this is until last year. This year, there's probably like another list of this size that just came to it. Like what happened in NLP is that uh, once we had these end-to-end -end models that given a supervised problem, solved them fairly well if you have enough data. Uh, a lot of the research that we've been doing has been on trying to figure out what data we feed to these and what are the tasks. And so uh, I think that's one way to, to sort of do research right now in NLP is to try and come up with QA data sets or generally data sets that push these, these models and uh, make them fail not too much but also not too little so that it's still motivating to work at those. Um, the way that these QI, uh, QA tasks are actually addressed are through fully differentiable models. Uh, there's some sort of neural network here. Uh, there's some representation of the question here, some representation of the text, and then you try to, uh, at training time, estimate the parameters of this model such that this question produces that answer, um, as usual. Um, the state-of-the-art architectures look a bit more complex, and we go through uh, one of those in, or actually two or three of those in the next couple of slides. Let's see if that makes sense. Um, 
rather than looking at state-of-the-art architectures in order to give you a sort of rough sense of what's happening, I'm going to decide, I'm going to focus on a very simple model, the so-called attentive reader by Hammond et al. This is a bit older, but it essentially has all the components of a new model and I think should be easy to follow. Um, I think I should stop here just because, you know, uh, this will take a bit and I don't think it makes sense to start it. Uh, so I'll see you after lunch. All right. Let's get started with the second half of this tutorial. I wanted to quickly say, as this came up during the break, that uh, at, at Facebook AI, we're also looking for interns. Uh, so if you're a PhD student uh, and interested in interning with us, do uh, get in touch. Um, I also wanted to say that I might have come across as a bit too negative about knowledge-based construction, which I didn't really intend. Uh, actually, I think for quite a few applications, it's really useful, in particular when you, and we had a long discussion during the break as well, in particular, if you or your client doesn't really know what they want to do with the data and they just want to understand what is there and look at it and then sort of make inferences that they yet, you know, don't know uh, what they are, then I think visualizing and representing the knowledge in text using, say, these graphs is a, is a really good way of giving you a different view on it. But if you have a quite concrete goal in mind, um, and say a ranking that you want to do because you want to find topics that your user should see or if you want to do question answering in natural language and that's what you want to do then uh, I think knowledge bases or knowledge based construction isn't of always the best solution. I also like to point out that at least anecdotally, anecdotally what I know is that uh, Google has somehow stopped their automatic knowledge base construction efforts. Uh, they, they still work with knowledge bases, but they have somewhat given up on extracting them automatically, um, which, you know, you can, you can interpret in many ways. But anyway, um, without further ado, let's talk about the attentive reader model. So this model is actually a model that was designed not for an extractive question answering task, but for a multiple choice question answering task where the input contains a text and the output is a distribution over entities in the text and uh, the right answer is the one uh, that you should put maximal probability of. Um, and I'll get to where that matters uh, later on when I go through this architecture. So I like to think about the machine reading architecture in these blocks or, or units and different architectures will have different instantiations of these units but they all have to one extent uh, the same high level structure. And so in this structure you usually start with representing the symbols as vectors and I've done this already quite a few times throughout the um, talk in the first half uh, so what the input is to your CNN is usually not a one-hot vector, it's maybe some kind of embedding and you have to um, you know, do this in one way or another. And, and the same holds here as well. I'll talk a little bit more about this but knowing that you have seen what to vec already, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Once you've done the input representation of the individual tokens, you do some form of composition to essentially contextualize the words and uh, give them a representation that is aware of the context around that word. Um, and there are various architectures for doing that, but you'll find this type of architectural block in most of the machine reading models. Once you have essentially represented, contextualized the question on the left, on the right side, and the background text on the left side, you combine them in some form of sequence interaction module that uh, uses essentially knowledge about the question to better represent the, the input text uh, and to make 
predicting an answer easier. And uh, then you combine essentially the information from the text and the information from the question into some kind of joint representation and then that joint representation is used to predict the actual answer. So that's a blueprint of a machine reading end-to-end -end model. Let's go through these step by step, starting with the input representation. Um, as you've heard, uh, words are discrete symbols, uh, but neural, vec neural networks operate on vectors. So what can you do to feed them into vector format? One obvious way is to construct one hot vectors like this one, which is, is nice but it has some problems. Uh, in particular, one-hot vectors don't really represent relationships between words. So the fact that rain and precipitation, that they mean somewhat similar things, that's not reflected in one-hot space. Um, they're also very high dimensional, which sometimes makes uh, processing them a little harder, say on your GPU. Um, and because of that, um, because of the fact that they don't represent these relations between words, they are also um, harder to generalize with. So really what you want is um, a representation such that maybe the re representation of rain and precipitation is similar, but rain and mozzarella is not similar. Um, so similar meaning of words should mean similar vector representations. That's the whole name of the game. Um, and so how can you, who has seen this example? Quite a few people. Uh, but uh, so how can, you, how can you capture sort of similarity of words? Well, by looking at the context of the word. This is actually, is this Ido Dagan's slide? No, this is Marco Baroni's slide, I think. Um, yeah, that is Marco Baroni. <clears throat> so uh, how do you know the meaning of a word? Uh, how can you say whether two words are similar? Well, you can look at uh, whether these words have similar contexts. Um, so you use the context to infer meaning, and there's the distributional hypotheses. Um, words that are used and occur in the same context tend to prefer similar meanings by Harris, and then the short version of that, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So all of that uh, is essentially just saying the meaning of a word depends on its context or the way it's used in, uh, in language. Um, one way to represent words uh, and to capture this type of hypothesis is to simply look at the term document matrix where um, I guess words here have uh, counts associated with the documents they appear in. So rain appears in D1, D2, and D4, uh, maybe in DM, and I really have a problem pronouncing this. Precipitation, no, I'm missing one syllable. Anyway, that word is uh, appearing in similar documents, and hence you would imagine that these two vectors will look similar. They will be somewhat collinear. Um, and, uh, and that's useful. So that's one way of representing words, but uh, this representation is really sparse, um, which means that often you don't actually get this kind of collinearity. Um, and you have problems of sparse representations. So one way to go about this is to approximate sparse matrices using low rank matrix factorization. So you can take this term document matrix, factorize it into a U and a sigma, um, sorry, um, and then, uh, sorry, a U, a sigma, and a V, and then the vectors in this U, in this smaller low dimensional uh, matrix, they correspond to the word vectors that you then use downstream. So that's one way to do it. Um, there's generally this notion of word embeddings where dense vector representations are produced and these have relatively low dimensionality, say 300. They capture word similarity. They're usually trained on large corpora that just contain words in context. Uh, standard examples were to vec, which you all know. Um, but there are other ways to do this. For example, you can use character-based word embeddings that look at the structure of the word itself, the internal structure, and represent or induce meaning from there. Um, 
relative vec, and again, I'll, I'll keep this really short, uh, is essentially a way to create these vectors by optimizing them to have maximal similarity for co-occurring words and minimal similarity between non-co-occurring words. Uh, so if you see rain and drop, these two vectors uh, should be close to each other, rain and mozzarella, because they're not seen in the same context. They should be far away from each other. And here, similarity or collinearity, sorry, co similarity is, is always or often thought as uh, collinearity, meaning that uh, you look at whether the dot product between the two vectors is, is high or not. Uh, so you would like to see uh, rain and precipitation um, close together and mozzarella sort of orthogonal to it. All right, and then uh, in particular, the way you do this in practice in word to vec is you take a word, you look at the context and the surrounding window here, more or less, there are more details to this. Uh, you make the dot product of these guys high and then the dot product of these guys with other things that aren't in the context um, low. Uh, you can show that uh, this is actually also implicitly factorizing some kind of uh, PMI matrix, like a point-wise mutual information matrix between the words. Um, Levy and Goldberg did show that. Um, and you can do all kinds of funny things with this, like projecting it onto some kind of low dimensional space where similar words indeed sort of are close to each other. And you can do fun stuff like um, the word analogy uh, problem, or oh, sorry, in this case, sorry, um, going from Russia to the capital uh, is the same as going from Turkey to its, capital, uh, to its capital. So in that vector space, you have these relations uh, that are captured just by directional moving in that space in the same direction. So there are all kinds of interesting phenomena that come out of this. Um, another way to think about this is just as a linear projection of the one hot vector. So uh, we're learning to, like if, if you like the end-to-end, -end, uh, let me just optimize things view, you can uh, think about this as sort of learning a, a matrix that maps one hot vectors to small dimensional vectors. And if you have some kind of objective, you can learn that uh, you can learn that matrix. All right, so that's the input. I kept uh, this relatively short just because you have seen, you have seen this. Uh, now there's the composition part, and you've seen parts of that already as well, so I will not talk too much about that either, but I think it's, it's useful as a refresher. Uh, so how do you compose words and tokens and their representation to new representations that represent not just the word, but the word in its compositional unit. And uh, why does this matter? Well, because language, in a way, is, is, is very compositional on, on many levels, right? Like there are words formed of characters, phrases formed of words, clauses formed of, fra uh, formed of phrases, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this kind of composition you want to capture in the way that you represent the tokens individually in a unit of text. Um, the big question is like when you do represent composition and, and context, which composition function do you use? And that essentially captures the inductive bias that you want to bring into your model. And there are a couple of decisions you can make. I'll go through those in a bit. Uh, in particular, do you model it as a sequence? Do you model it as a tree? Maybe do you model it as a, as a graph structure? Do you think the underlying structure uh, that you want to capture is, is just a sequence of words or should there be a graph? Or um, are there just bags of words that we don't need to worry about at all? Uh, we don't need to worry about uh, higher order structure, so you can do this. Uh, what people find is that on different levels here, you use different kinds of biases. So maybe on the character level, you do some kind of, uh, say, convolutional representation, but then on the word or phrases level, you use a recurrent representation. So all of that is fair game. Um, and one of the core challenges generally is to make sure that your model can capture potential long distance relationships in your document. And that's, that's always a big, big question. And I'll talk about how the different approaches can capture those. Um, in particular, and I said this before, one of the core things that you want your representation to capture is this notion of co-reference. Is this word here actually just a reference to a word earlier? 
Uh, and if so, I should probably inherit the representation of that word or be affected by that representation for the representation of the current word. And yeah, you want to sort of model this in a way that uh, information flow is, is effective and you can learn these things easily. Um, more practically, what you want is, uh, I guess, something that captures the following thing, that moving from Gospitch to Prague is roughly meaning the same as moving, uh, leaving Gospitch for Prague, and that the meaning of Prague in both of these contexts is sort of the same. It has the same function, uh, whereas leave Prague for Gospitch is actually the opposite, and you want to represent that differently. Using just word vectors, you can't do this, right? Because clearly, uh, you have the same word vector statically created with word to vec for Prague, and you use this in all sentences. It will always be the same, even though you want those meanings to differ. So, I guess what you want is vectors that differ depending on the context. Um, Generally, the way you do this is you take the actual input vectors and then do something with them to produce the contextual vectors. And there are various things you can do with them um, and various composition functions. Recurrent neural networks are one. Um, and again, you have seen those. Uh, so I keep this short. Here, you calculate the representation of a current token based on the representation or the hidden representation of the previous token and the current observation, or in this case, word embedding. Uh, and you do that recursively throughout the sentence or throughout whatever unit you are processing. So uh, the idea here is that text is a sequence, uh, not a generic graph, but a sequence. And uh, there are various uh, types. Uh, I think most prominently you have LSTMs and GRUs, uh, which are still frequently used, but maybe being a little replaced by transformers recently. Um, there's an inductive bias here, which is recency. You're kind of saying that like, the meaning of a word in context depends on all the history, but most directly it depends on the previous word. Um, and that can be a quite useful bias. Uh, but sometimes that's also not quite true. But generally, yeah, more recent symbols have bigger impact on the hidden state. Um, it's generally a great way of representing context and has been a bread and butter representational mechanism for quite a while. Uh, it's nice because everything is connected, even though this token is quite far away from this token, there's still information flowing through if you choose the right uh, RNN unit. And so, so that's nice. In theory, it, if you had enough data, you could learn any kind of thing. Um, and I think we've learned to train these quite well, um, robustly in practice. So there's a lot of knowledge out there how to do this. And I think you, you, can, you can get this right without too much problems. Disadvantages, it's somewhat slow in the sense that you cannot paralyze it. Uh, so you can't represent or calculate the representation for this token before you have calculated this one and for this one and this one and this one and this one. And hence, um, uh, you can't just paralyze it. You have to wait n time, time steps until you represent every word in the, in the sentence. Um, it's also not particularly good for long distance or long range dependencies, even though in theory it can do it. Uh, because of that recency bias that sort of works against you when you actually really want to uh, go back a long way. And because of that, I think mostly it's been looking, uh, it's been used to look at sentences and smaller paragraphs, not uh, too long of a, of a document. There are also variants of this that don't assume a sequential structure but say a tree structure, say you have a syntactic parse tree of the sentence, then instead of letting information flow left to right or right to left, you can let it flow up and down on that parse tree. And sometimes that helps, but I think many of these are somewhat out of fashion at this point, partly because they always require you to run a parser, uh, which creates noise, which creates overheads, which you know, might not even exist for the language that you care about. So um, 
I'd say um, generally I haven't seen so much of this recently. All right, that's one example of a composition function. I'll talk a little about more later, but now let me first go bottom up to um, the top. So we have input representations, we have composition, and then we have sequence interaction. Uh, and again, here, I guess the whole name of the game is answering questions. Uh, so you, at some point, you have to represent the input with respect to what the questions are, because uh, whatever the answer is, like, you can't highlight that in your representation if you haven't seen uh, what the question is. And so in this layer, essentially, representation and information that we gathered for the question and for the text, they're combined. And one way to do this is through a simple, sorry, this is actually just saying what I say. One way to do this is to uh, just concatenate basically the question and the text and then do everything that we did already before. Um, say with your RNN. That's possible, um, but there's a problem with long range dependencies because now, at least when you model with an RNN, your, um, your question and maybe the answer, uh, when you concatenate those, they might be really far away from each other and it's really difficult for the RNN to c recover that kind of dependency. Uh, one thing you can do is use attention. Um, and that's in fact what people do most of the time in this, in this context, uh, A, because of transformers, but B, also even before. Um, so let's say we want to produce a representation for the background text, and we want to rep produce this representation such that I can answer the question well. So really, uh, if my question is where did he move to, um, I need to sort of highlight or focus in that final representation that feeds into the classifier that actually makes a decision. I need to represent Prague here, right? So I should have uh, more weight on Prague and maybe less weight on Gostwich. And if I have that, then if I propagate that information further on, a classifier can figure out, oh, the right answer should be Prague. You can do this using attention, which essentially is relevance weighted pooling of vectors across sequences. And you have learned about attention as well. So I again keep that short. Um, crucial part is that your attention mask, this alpha t here, will depend on your question. So you use a question representation, which then drives the actual um, attention mask and decides how to weigh the different representations in the, in the sequence. So, more formally, uh, you have, for a given token t, uh, you look at, or you create the, the, the weight for that token by calculating some kind of function that depends on the representation of that token and the representation of the query. And then you represent, uh, you represent the whole uh, output representation of the context using just the weighted combination of the original uh, YTs such that these alpha T's sum up to one. That's just plain attention, so n nothing new here. So just in this graph, here is some kind of uh, attentive pooling going on. Here's a representation of the question. Here we combine them, for example, by concatenating them. Uh, and then we're almost ready to produce the answer. One thing I wanted to show you is like an example of that, of the attention mask for the model that we present on the data set this, that this uh, model was trained on. It was an, an interesting data set. It's actually not the squad data set. It's the CNN Daily Mail data set, uh, which is somewhat different from squad in that it was created automatically using sort of summary sentences we had for news, or they had for news articles, in which you highlight, sorry, in which you mask the actual gold answer. And so your question here is not a natural language question, it's what's called a close or fill the gap question. I'll get back to that later, actually. Uh, now, you can see the attention map calculated, as I showed you before, for a given model on the answer here. Uh, showing you that it actually identified the right answer 
through the attention. Um, do you notice anything with the, the way this is written? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so, so all of the entities here were uh, replaced by anonymous entity IDs, uh, which was a very conscious and, and I think interesting decision. And what happens when you don't do this kind of stuff is that especially with the kind of um, articles they're looking at and the biases in the newspaper, if you had, for example, any question that would say something like XXX breast, no, sorry, something, 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 breast X, something, 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 you know what the answer is? Uh, say again? Say again? I said breast one, but it's one. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, maybe we get into that offline. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have used breast, but anyway, uh, in the Daily Mail, you would get cancer as the standard answer for any sort of X that follows breast. That's just what the Daily Mail talks about a lot of times when breast is a topic. So you don't have to understand the actual article in order to answer the question. And that's one of the small but really, I think, dominant type of phenomena we have to deal with when creating these data sets. They're really easy, and that's a general thing with, with these sort of end-to-end -end models, right? They get really good at what they do, but often for the wrong reason. And uh, in this case, just because they know, you know, cancer follows breast, I don't have to even look at the text to, to figure out what you're asking me. Um, they replaced uh, all the entities with these anonymous IDs such that that wouldn't happen uh, necessarily, like it can't know that cancer is cancer. It just knows cancer is end 52, and then it needs to look at the text to figure out that it's actually cancer. Um, all right. So now um, we have the sequence interaction. We have some kind of representation that combines representations of the background text and the question. And uh, now we map that to an answer and the answer selection step. And this step will differ depending on whether you're doing extractive QA or multiple choice QA. Like in the case of multiple choice QA, um, you just have a bunch of candidates and you produce a softmax over those using the final representation of the uh, model that you have. If you do spans and text, you essentially produce two distributions, one over the start position and one over the end position of the extracted span. But the way you feed those distributions with representations is pretty much the same. And you have some kind of cross-entropy loss, either on the um, output predictions over the possible entity candidates or over the uh, possible starting or ending positions. And that's essentially a machine reading model in a nutshell. They mostly all look like that. Um, there are other kinds of composition functions that uh, we, can, we can talk about it. One thing are convolutional networks, sorry, convolutional layers, um, which essentially model the input as a collection of n-grams, right? Uh, which might be an actual good bias if you think that really, like, there aren't many long distance relationships that I care about. Uh, mostly I can consider a document as a bag of n-grams and uh, that's it. If you know that about your task, it's a really good idea to just think about it from the perspective of a convolutional network. Um, and often we see, especially when you have less data, we see much better results with convolutional networks um, in practice. So generally you sort of look at a quite limited context around a token and then uh, use that to represent that token. That's, that's pretty much all there is. Uh, and then you do some kind of pooling to produce one single representation for the whole sequence. Uh, it's very fast and parallelizable, uh, which is why people like this as well. Um, it is, after all, a limited context window. Uh, there's a remedy to that, which is you stack these convolutional layers a few times, and maybe you also do, uh, use dilation, as in you have um, slightly wider windows sometimes that 
step over a few local tokens to combine the representation of far, further away tokens. So all of that is possible. Um, I think we've seen these being used often for character-based representations, maybe multi-word representations, uh, not so much in machine reading. And then there is the self-attention layer. Um, well, one way to think about self-attention is as some kind of latent graph on the text where words uh, have relationships and the way to represent one word depends on sort of related words in the sentence. And self-attention just learns what are these related words, picks them for them, and then uses those representations to produce the current representation. Um, so, for example, you produce the representation here at uh, y3 using a function of the input representations, which might either be word representations or representations produced by a previous layer. Um, and you essentially produce k representations in such a self-attention layer, uh, one for each attention head. And uh, each of these are, again, weighted combinations of the input, uh, the input token representations. And uh, then you produce some kind of nonlayer function that um, combines these, these, uh, these vectors and produces the new, the new vector. Sorry. Yeah? For every word, you produce k vectors? Yeah. So for every K, for every channel of that, or head of that attention, you have, for each word, and for each target word, you have an alpha. So there's like a square number of alphas for, uh, for a sentence, and then K times of that. Okay. And how are the alpha learned? Sorry. Say again? How are the alpha learned? How, oh, so the alphas how are, do you learn alpha? So the alphas are essentially, um, for example, dot products of, uh, the, uh, the actual input representations. So how much does you know, this vector that you're looking at relate to that vector? Uh, some function of that. So you use the previous layer's sort of representation in order to figure out like, what are the closed words in, in, in this layer, and then use those representations to combine to get the new representations. You, did you talk about self-attention? Our transformers? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So here, the alpha k t is um, the weights for a particular token t and a particular head k. Uh, this can capture really long distance dependencies, and that's really the beauty of, of those. They uh, can really refer pretty much anywhere without any recency bias which can be good um, because you can really capture these long distance dependencies. It can also be bad because it might be harder to learn. Um, they're somewhat paralyzable. So each of these heads, sorry, for each of the tokens, the representations, you can calculate in, in isolation, uh, in parallel. You don't have to wait for this representation to produce that representation, which is quite, which is quite useful. Um, disadvantages. Often you have to carefully set up hyperparameters, at least that's how it was. Uh, I, I think we got better at that as well over time. It's just with a new type of paradigm or new type of unit coming in, I think it takes a bit until we figure out the, uh, the best way to run those. I think by now we're pretty good at that. Uh, there's somewhat of expensive computation involved, right? Because you, for a sequence of length n, you do n square. Uh, computations just on one layer and one attention head, uh, which scales quadratically with the length of the document, and uh, that sometimes is not, not that good. It's generally good for quite long uh, phrases, sentences, and paragraphs. I think the minute you look at really long documents, things can become somewhat slow. Um, So things that you can capture with self-attention are actually co-reference chains, and it's been shown that uh, these models are pretty good at picking up co-reference chains implicitly, uh, as well as syntactic dependency structure and text. So you look at these attentions and attention heads, uh, and some of them might point to syntactic 
heads of the current world or syntactic modifiers of the current world, showing that they learn something meaningful uh, without actually having been trained on syntactic information. So uh, here's an example of uh, a co-reference visual visualization, which I think was interested. It actually picked up the sort of common sense uh, phenomena that I discussed earlier. So if you look at the attention for it, um, then when it, it was too tired, it was the animal. When it was too wide, it was the, it was the street that the self-attention model was attending over. So it has the ability to learn implicitly things like co-reference and dependency structure, which I think is really quite powerful. Um, it's pretty much now used in most of the state-of-the-art models, uh, including language modeling, natural language inference, um, QA. And really, given that transformers are just, just essentially layers of self-attention, um, it's pretty much everywhere right now. So this is the way that most of the work, uh, or most of the models that come out right now seem to operate. Just to bring this all together, a um, couple of possible composition functions you can use, RNNs, um, if you want to capture recency bias, CNNs, if you capture local engram patterns, self-attention, if you want to capture long-range dependencies. Okay, uh, you can obviously stack these things. Um, so if you have uh, you know, some kind of input, you can iterate through the same kind of uh, unit a couple of times, layer after layer, uh, to get, for example, in the case of CNN, wider, uh, wider sort of receptive fields um, or just more abstract representations. So that's usually a thing people do quite a bit. Uh, maybe not so much for pure RNNs because they're themselves relatively deep as when you process text over time, you're essentially adding layer over layer. Um, okay, CNN-based models are usually quite deep because of what I said. So uh, QANet, which I talk about uh, briefly later, essentially 42 layers of CNNs uh, and then 21 self-attention layers. Uh, there are also residual layers that directly connect one layer to the other. Um, as this is something that has been shown to be useful. Um, Self-attention is often applied after layers of CNN and RNN. At least that's the case for um, the QA models that we saw in 2018. 2019 has changed this quite a bit. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Because the exception is the transformer, which kind of doesn't do that. All right, so here's one slightly more state-of-the-art architecture for machine reading that somewhat fits into the same um, blueprint, but is slightly more complex. Um, again, you have some kind of input representation layer. That's the same thing. Um, you have composition on the individual input context and question layer. And here these sort of stacked embedding encoder blocks which are, I think, combinations of CNNs and uh, self-attention. Uh, then you mix those in sequence uh, interaction. So you use the context and the query, and you attend over both. Uh, and you sort of wiggle a bit and, and uh, sort of represent this a little further through a couple of stack models. And then at the top, you're predicting the first token index of the answer, the span answer, and here the last token index of the span answer. So that's an example of a extractive model, right, where you have these two output heads, uh, one predicting a softmax over input uh, tokens uh, representing the beginning, and the other one input tokens representing the end. That's pretty much it. Um, composition, as I said, there is, um, five layers of convolutions here, and then one time uh, self-attention. Um, it's bidirectional bi attention in the sequence interaction layer, and then more convolutions, self-interaction, uh, self-attention in uh, the further composition layer. And here, usually, and that's, that's usually the case, in the span scoring bit, you have just linear projections, um, some kind of softmax, 
and that's that's it. So I say this is a state of the architecture, state of the art architecture, because it is if you take out BERT, which sort of changed, as I said, pretty much everything. But I think even BERT somewhat operates similarly. It's quite deep. Uh, there are 68 compositional layers. Uh, no RNNs, so it's parallelizable and fast. It is a model on squad. It's not the current best model anymore. Um, Uses self-attention, data augmentation, a lot of other things that, in a way, the BERT follow-ups did, didn't do explicitly, but certainly they also benefit from unlabeled data. Um, it's parallelizable. That's good. So here's the actual uh, transformer-based state-of-the-art architecture uh, based on BERT. And I'll talk a bit about BERT a little later. Um, for the time being, uh, I'll keep this very high level. So again, even in this architecture, you have I guess, input embeddings um, that uh, the individual tokens are mapped to. So that's there. Um, then you have composition. So this essentially is one big transformer uh, representing both the input tokens and the questions. So in this transformer, in these various transformer layers, you're actually doing both the composition and the sequence interaction at the same time, at all times. So it's really at, at every point, at every layer of this network, uh, the representation for a particular, um, say, background token in the background text is already informed by the question. Uh, and just you, keep, you keep on doing this with a very uniform architecture, just the transformer of a couple of layers, until at the end, you produce these representations for each token, and those are then used to predict the start and end span of, uh, of the actual answer. So it's actually quite beautiful in the sense that it's much simpler. Um, as uh, any of the previous models, in a way, if, if you identify simplicity with just uniform nature of the architecture. It's really just transformers. Uh, transformers of the text and uh, the question. And what I said was a crazy idea earlier to just you know, concatenate the question and the text and then do RNN sort of representations over that and then do the answer prediction with that. That's exactly what you're doing here. The reason that you can do that here is because um, you are really good at, at keeping or at modeling long distance dependencies with the transformer. So, so that's really how currently machine reading models work, uh, the best state of the art models on the benchmark data sets we have. Um, bunch of references you can look up when I share the slides later. Um, just to conclude this part, and then we get to the fun bit. Uh, so we gathered all ingredients to build state of the art supervised machine reading QA systems, um, representing words, modeling compositionality, modeling the interaction between um, question and paragraph, and then answer questions by either pointing to the start and end, or maybe actually choosing a candidate from a set of candidate answers. And generally, these things work pretty well as long as we stay in the main and questions are simple. All right, great. Um, so all of this looks, looks great, and in fact, it's been impressive progress uh, in this field in the sense that uh, these are the results on squad over the last, well, I guess like three years. And uh, this green line is the uh, human performance. Uh, these are the models. And we're actually hitting human performance level. That was 2018. In 2019, we're kind of there. Uh, so that's... That's pretty amazing. Um, it, it goes to show that if you give the community a, uh, a benchmark data set uh, and uh, sort of end-to-end -end differentiable architectures you can optimize towards that, they can get quite far. Um, actually, to be honest, the uh, performance increases we see through BERT aren't just through that. I mean, they're definitely through the pre-training uh, information that comes in. Um, I'd, uh, I think people got a bit too excited about, about this. Uh, I showed you some news like that earlier. I, I think it's really, it's really far away from us or them reading better than, than we at this point. And to drive that point home, I'll want to have some, um, some fun. <laughs> 
So I think it's, I mean, generally when you do, when you do NLP or any kind of, um, any kind of uh, machine learning, it's very useful to play around with the models, the data, and get a sense of uh, what these things do. So let's, let's do this. And uh, I wanted to do this with my buddy, Andreas Vlachas. Did he actually show up? Like he's, he's not around here, but pe do people know his face, his, his hair? All right, okay, good. Um, so let's, uh, let's play around with this a bit. So this is a sort of online app that we built at UCL just to play around with this, uh, this kind of technology. And it's pretty simple. You just put in the text and you ask, a, yeah, you ask questions. So I can do all kinds of amazing things with this. Like, um, where does Andreas work? And that, that's pretty much correct. So it's pretty good at that. Uh, when did he start to work at? That's pretty cool. Um, so, so that works. How about, uh, this is a very self-centered uh, demo. Um, who did he work with at? Awesome, that's really great. Um, <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> so I, I can feel that kind of love. Uh, actually, that should be Andreas. Andrea, maybe, but probably not. So, um, so that's great. Who does Andrea? What? <laughs> what is that? Uh, who does uh, feel completely indifferent to? Well, you get the picture. Um, it, it is basically not really reading at all, uh, right? It, it, in, in this case, uh, it has learned something like, if it says the word, or it sees the word who, maybe it should look for a person. Uh, I'm, I guess, the first other person there that isn't Andreas. Uh, I'm actually the first like named entity that is a, uh, that is a person in, in this text, so I, it probably just picked up that, right? Uh, and uh, there are other kind of things you cannot do that, I mean, yes? Better. Uh, is this train on squad 1.0 or 2.0? So that's, that's a good point. I, I get because 2.0 has the I don't know answer. It has the I don't know answer. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's completely correct. I. Um, I think it would do a bit better in this case, yeah. uh, that's for sure. Um, and I talk about score 2.0. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying second. that it would be much better, but at least it may say, I don't know, instead of just of, yes. picking the random yeah. person. That's right. In the text. I think that, that's a great point. In a way, I'm being unfair to this model because it has never really seen, yeah. um, it has never learned to say no. Yeah. Um, so it will, always, it will always do that. So other things you cannot do is, is reasoning with this. So maybe if I write Andreas is the son of, um, uh, I don't know Andreas that well, even though he, he loves me that much. So uh, is the son of Greek name? Uh, say again? Oh no, like this? As the son of Gorgas, uh, Gorgas is the son of Stanos. Is that a name? <laughs> Stanos. Is that a name? No. <laughs> Did I just make that up? <laughs> why, why do I think Stanos is a name? Yanis, no, Yanis, I know. Yeah. Is, is, the, is the son of. Um, Son of Janos. Um, so, in a way, it's obvious that it cannot answer. Um, or, well, actually, let's let's try it. Who is the grandson of 
Giannis. No, hold on. Go is the son of who's no that that is right. It, yeah, that is definitely not true. Um, so it could have gotten that right if it had like some sense of what that really means, but it doesn't. Um, cool. I want to point you to something else, uh, which I hope you can play around with as well. So this is a slightly different setting. Um, I, okay, so this looks like a bit like a detour, but actually this is pretty much what the field currently does. Like we're all playing around with these models that have learned quite amazing things. We don't know quite why and, and where they break. We just know that they do really well on our benchmarks, but we still have that feeling that they're not really understanding language. Um, so the other thing that we've been doing is we're building this beat the AI uh, game. If you go to that, go to that URL, I really recommend you to go there. Uh, I wish, no, I don't know how to zoom into, is that readable? Uh, okay. Just type it up for, for later or now. Um, so this is a, a game where you have to beat the AI in coming up with questions that have answers in that text that um, the AI doesn't get right. It's actually really fun. And I thought maybe we can, we can try some of this, partly based on what I told you earlier about all the challenges in natural language understanding and, and machine reading, things like coreference, variation, all of this you can still use to fool the, the model here. So I haven't seen this text. Uh, unfortunately, it always generates new text, so I couldn't even prepare for this. Uh, so we really have to work on this together. Um, do you, does anyone want to start with setting up uh, a question and an answer that we think the AI won't get? Yes. What is in? Oh, that's a different example, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's hard. Like, you all have different examples. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Anyone want to start? Like, so yeah. who's, <laughs> uh, what, which, who's German? <laughs> Who is German? <laughs> who's, who's? Like who's ah, who's class German? Who's class? No, sorry. Who's class German? Who's chair? Chair. Ah, chair. Okay, okay. <laughs> who's chair? <laughs> sorry, I should read this text. I haven't even read this text. Okay. Uh, uh, who's the chair? Who is the what? Who's the class? Who's class? Who is no, that's too easy. No, we know, get it. Yeah, maybe we start with something easy. Why not? That's the, yeah. Who is the chairman of, who is the German, the chairman of the club? <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me. Read. Mm. You mean by club, we mean the, the, Augusta, the Augusta National. National. It's like a golf club, right? So the president is a member of the club, and then the chairman wants to take out the Yeah, the OK, trillion. so like this. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this should be, this should be doable. Uh, and that's partly because the club's chairman is right around there. Um, but we can, we can play around with this a bit. OK, so let's do it. Whoa, like AI won. It actually got it, got it right. Yes, what? For instance, asking a pine what? A pine yes. what? Pine. So making reference to the first three words. Yeah. Instead of just saying like oh a, a little, little pine, you ask oh a pine what? <laughs> a pine what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just like that. Just like very colloquial. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm under pressure. What? I'm. <laughs> oh, what kind of? Is that what you mean? 
That's not what you mean. That's too easy. But like, I didn't get the. So, but my question would be, how many sentences are Is the answer extractive? Yeah, yeah, that's just right. How many sentences? No, this should work. No, I mean, let's see. Yeah, sure, that, that, that'd get. So you wanted to say how many sentences are in the document? Yeah, that's not, I guess that's it's not extractive. Come on, like now you're being uh, <laughs> a, a little mean. Right. That's not something. Let's, uh, let's go back to, I mean, I just want to. Is so many, et cetera, et cetera. A span in the tree? Uh, sorry, a span in the in the text? How many times did the president hit the tree? How many times did the president hit the tree? And what do you want the answer to be? So many times? So many times that he proposed that it be cut down. Okay. So many. I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, it's not that, that bad. No, no, I mean, that's just a question of how you. But uh, it's partially correct. I think it's almost fully correct if you just think of uh, syntactic heads. Yeah, that's the same head. Yeah. Um, That's true. Yeah. So many times. I think that's not bad. Let me try something else. Um, so just something simple like. Who was against cutting the tree? Who is the head of the, of the. So what I'm trying to do here is actually just seeing if, if I ask for the club's chairman, right, that's easy because it just matches the chairman, uh, like literally, lexically, there is a lot of overlap, right? Um, so if I replace club with Augusta National Union and head or like chairman with head, uh, does the model still get that right? And so that should still be Clifford Roberts. And it didn't even get that right. So, um, so you don't even have to go that far to, to break it. It's just, and this was an example of variation that uh, I was just throwing at the model and it would, it would break with a bit of variation. Uh, I think we can also get a co-reference example here uh, if, we, if we look a bit. So can we come up with a question that requires co-reference as, uh, as a step in coming up with the answer? Yeah. What, did, what should the answer be? Uh, Eisenhower. Oh, yeah. <laughs> should really read this. Um, <laughs> I did get that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you. All right. But I think so. So that's interesting. Um, I, I think because you ask for damage, and the closest thing to damage in the text is ice storm. Uh, so I could probably ask what damaged. Um, So uh, it's probably not actually doing co-reference in this example. I love this. I, this is a lot of fun. Do play around with it. I, we can do a bit more, but. Uh, what is the, what is the data set that you're trying to conduct? What is the data set? No, okay, what? <laughs> uh, say again? That was a question, right? That was a question to you. To me, yes. Um, so. Uh, 
we, we're currently constructing this data set like as an adversarial data set. It's not yet called in any way. Um, but I guess part of this research is to essentially build up this loop where you know, we get a model, we get like users adversarially producing these questions, then retrain the model, make it better, and then do it again, and keep on doing this until maybe we get to a point where these things actually are understanding language. Yeah. Uh, which one? Co oh, a co-reference system, you mean? Yeah, it's oh, okay. such a good job that I would expect this to be available to the uh, question. Okay. Uh, that's good to know. That's encouraging. All right, play around. Okay, one, uh, one more. Is it, a, is it a proposal for a question? No, it's a question for you. It's an actual question. Okay, yeah. I would like to ask how do you handle the notion of time? Uh, for example, if we have uh, uh, several documents, uh, that refer back to history. Let's take the club, for example. If you had uh, uh, the composition of the members and the chairman for many years, and we ask the question, who is the chairman? What should be the correct answer? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a great point. Uh, no, there wouldn't be a correct answer then. The question is somewhat either underspecified, uh, if, if it's sort of completely out of context, or you need to look at something that's called conversational um, QA, where, where essentially you might have a dialogue in which you at some point indicate that now you're looking at this year, right? Or like around the time when Eisenhower was, you know, around, like who was the president then? Um, and you can have that either in your question as, as part of the, the context, right? I'm asking about this specific year. Uh, uh, or you have some kind of dialogue with the question answering model before and I remember that. So there exist some data sets that do a bit like that that might help you. But it's, it's, it's definitely not answerable if, if you just ask who is the president of the US. I mean, actually now it is because you would probably default to who is it right. now. But um, but still, yeah, you, you want to specify. And during the training, do we encode the, the year or the notion of uh, that this thing happened before that one uh, as a correlation, as, as a connection, or we let the model decide that as well? Uh, so in, in the training data here, no, there is no such thing. There is really just questions and answers and text. And often the, the questions in squad, they're very contextual. So they sometimes really like, when was he born? Which is a question you cannot ask to Google and, um, unless you talk to Google before and, and, and Google knows who you're talking about. Um, so yeah. Thank you. All right. All right, so maybe not quite solved. So they work well when the question is answerable. When, when it's not answerable, it might just give you random results. Uh, when relevant paragraphs are actually given, text is given, uh, the paragraph isn't too long, so if you really put a lot of data into it, like, for example, a lot of uh, even noisy or conflicting information about the president of that union, uh, it will not know what to do. Um, and if the answer that you infer is not too complex, so like even doing multi-hop grandfather inference isn't that easy. Um, and generally, if the answer process is some form of pattern matching or soft text alignment between the question and the text. Like, it's like, ooh, this is the area. Ah, I look at the question. I know you're looking for a person. Around this person, the words look like they relate to that question. So that, that's got to be the answer. This is to some extent what these models do, but they do it really well. And it turns out that many of the data sets, but also even I think applications are actually quite uh, um, quite suitable for, for that behavior. I mean, that's all you need. So if, if, you, if you look at it from a very applied point of view, it's okay. But if you look at it from the point of view of do we understand or do machines understand natural language, then uh, certainly not. Um, and also like you have to have same domain doing training and test time. So if you use biological text and you answer or you ask for questions that uh, require some kind of biological background knowledge in terms of lexical knowledge that you have, uh, it would be hard to do. Um, 
This has been studied in, in uh, research and a bunch of papers that all looked at the problems with these models, uh, starting with Gia's work in 2017 or so, uh, where they noticed the following phenomena. When you have a question in squad like this one, and you answer, the, uh, you answer this question based on this text, then it's pretty good at getting the right answer. If you add some kind of adversarial extra sentence to it, that just looks like it's somewhat related to the answer. Like there's also a uh, quarterback in there, there's a Super Bowl or a bowl, so uh, there's some sort of Latin uh, numbers. Um, and so that, uh, that really confuses the system. And then it would return Jeff Dean. And we've kind of seen this already to some extent. So that's one, one issue. So GNL showed that they can be easily fooled by these adversarial sentences. Um, so really a lot of the work in machine reading has then focused on how to improve the robustness against these kind of adversarial attacks or more natural questions that might emerge that you have in practice. Um, one of the things that are crucial, and this is where squad one and squad two comes in, is uh, solvability. Like you have to start modeling the fact that some questions you ask cannot be answered by the given text. So uh, in this case, you're asking about the name of that 1937 treaty, and that's not even um, um, hold on, but that's not even given here. Like there is no uh, there's no name for that, so you can't answer that question. And it turns out that when you augment your squad data with questions that can't be answered and you look at, at this point, the current state of the art at that time, the numbers drop from something that's really close to human performance to 20 points below that. So even if you, if you train with data like that, it becomes much harder to actually decide is this an answerable question or not? Can I actually answer this? Like to, to do that, you really have to understand the question better and that's much harder for the model. There have been various kinds of attacks that people have been, yeah? If the question is answerable or not, is it on the last stage of, of the model or so is it like classification between all of them or does it happen somewhere earlier? No, it happens quite late. So you get representations um, for, your, for your context and the question, and then based on the final output, say, of your transformer, you can also make that decision. Um, so you, you really understand the, the context a bit more, and then you make that call, which I, th I think makes sense. Yeah, just wondering why it gets so much harder if it's just like one more output. Oh, it's not, it's not harder because there is another output. It's just because you're making the problem harder because to know whether the, so if you, if you know that the question is always answerable uh, and for example, there's only one entity, one person in the background text and you have a who question, the only thing the model needs to learn is, oh, I just find the the type of the question and then I find the person, right? That's all I need to know. If, if the model has to sometimes actually say, oh, there is a who question, but actually uh, this who question doesn't even relate to um, what I am, um, what's in the text here, then the model has to sort of understand the question and understand that the text doesn't relate to it. So it's just a much harder problem uh, and that makes it harder. So you need more data for that. Yeah, I, as, from my perspective, I totally understand it, but it's just a statistical model. Why, just, why doesn't it just learn? Oh yeah, it might, but you need more data for okay. more complex behavior. So, that, that, I mean, that's true. There's nothing fundamentally uh, difficult about that problem in terms of modeling it. Well, you add like another output to the, the thing. I mean, that's always easy, that's never the problem. The problem is that now like, uh, you need to have examples that, so for example, if, um, if in your training set, somehow your training set is not big enough and most of the examples, even though they have unsolvable questions in there, uh, have persons 
person questions and no person questions but unsolvable answers, then if at test time you see a person question that is unsolvable, like you will not have learned this because your training set didn't give you that signal. So, so you just need to see more data to see that behavior well. I, I think that's the main issue. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, so essentially that's all happening through the embedding and the composition layers. So you would first hope that uh, even at the very bottom layer, at the static word representation layer that feeds into the input representation, at that point two words with roughly the same meaning will have roughly the same vector. Um, what your contextual and compositional mechanism helps you with is in a way making sure that the two words, if they, if they have sometimes the same meaning, but in this context they have different meanings, then that representation will hopefully pick it up. But like synonymy is, is, is often already addressed fairly low level uh, through the word vector. Yeah. All right. So there, I'd say there are two types of attacks. You can, you can do on these machine reading models. Uh, one is due to the fact that these models are too sensitive. So um, they change their predictions when the input changes just a tiny bit. And that's a problem. The prediction should actually be the same. Uh, for example, um, what you've seen before when you append a sentence, that's, that's a sort of meaningless change to the input. That shouldn't make a difference to the output, but it does produce a different output. So that's a type of oversensitivity attack. Uh, you can remove words, and some words really matter, but there's certainly words that shouldn't matter when you remove them. Uh, but sometimes the model then starts to predict really different things just because you remove them. You might flip some characters. Clearly, you can still read the text, and even if some characters are flipped, you'd still get the, the meaning. But uh, your model might be really sensitive to that. Uh, then you might just paraphrase, and this is where synonyms come in, come in as well. You might just paraphrase the, the question or paraphrase the text, and all of a sudden it stopped working. And uh, while there is a basic mechanism to handle that, by no means is that a robust mechanism that, uh, that works all the time. And it's particularly, actually, this is something that is particularly frustrating, I think, for real users uh, of this kind of system and I'm saying this with like my experience of we had a startup that was working in this space doing question answering trying to build question answering models for actual uh, companies and and for a purpose and uh, they produce extremely interesting results but when you have somebody to play around with it and they just slightly reformulate the question and all of a sudden the results are really different and that's a very um, disturbing experience that gives you very little confidence in something that if you just look at the numbers, if you just like look at the numbers, it should actually be quite strong and convincing. So uh, that's an issue. Uh, there's also the opposite, where uh, models are not sensitive enough. Um, they don't change their predictions when the input changes a lot. So this is something we're currently investigating quite, quite a bit at UCL as well. Um, and uh, it's sort of related to what we did when we played around with, one second. Um, when we played around with that demo. So what we have here is um, an original question and the predicted answer, which is the correct answer based on the context that we had. Uh, and here you have a slightly changed question where we just replaced uh, battle with expedition and Hastings with Roger. Uh, certainly for this, the answer should be not solvable. Uh, but the model isn't doing that. The model is even more confidently predicting William the Conqueror. Uh, and so you can automatically search in this space of questions and find examples like that. You can, quite, you can find quite a few of that. Like the, the models, even, even BERT, uh, are really um, vulnerable to this type of attack. And um, what I think is interesting, and uh, this relates somewhat to this question of why is solvability even um, difficult. So, what happens when you, so we can generate these training examples, or we can generate these adversarial examples, and then we can say, well, 
I know that this guy should be non-solvable, so let's create a data point for our model and then train that model with that to make it less uh, vulnerable to this type of attack. That's standard thing. That's a standard thing you do in adversarial learning, uh, and it usually helps you with making the model less vulnerable to that particular attack. Uh, and if you're lucky, then on the test set, you don't get this kind of behavior. But usually, it also means that on the test set, uh, you don't actually get you, you don't necessarily get better because adversarial examples aren't in the test set, and so you don't get benefits from that in your final table in that paper that decides whether you uh, accept it or not. So one thing we found though, and uh, which we got really excited, is that when you have a, uh, when you have a machine reading data set that is biased, for example, we took a subset of score two and looked at all the questions that ask for a person where there's only one person in the context. And then at test time, we ask the questions where there are several persons in the context, right? Just using NER as a way to feel that, uh, to test that. When you look at the performance of, uh, of BERT on, on this, and you look at the performance of an adversary regulated thing, you get quite some improvements. For example, with numbers. So like we had a training set where there was only one number in the text, and I ask you how often, or whatever, um, and we had a test set where there were two numbers or three numbers in that. If you use this kind of regularization, you actually get much better at answering these type of, uh, or dealing with this kind of bias in the training set. Uh, which is interesting because that's, that's not only about solvable or non-solvable, and learning how to differentiate that, it's about really understanding the question. So when, when you actually force the model to decide between solvable and non-solvable, it has to start to interpret the question in much more deeper ways. And that's something that we found and then help us to generalize to these biased training sen sentences. Um, apart from just trying to regularize your model, make it like less vulnerable, uh, it is good to just analyze why the model is doing what it does. And so a lot of research has just been going into these probes, these, these models or these approaches that figure out what exactly is the model doing and why is it doing it. Um, and in, so for example, Ribery and Al um, had this paper on anchors where they tried to find for a given question um, the set of features or the subset of words that matter when it actually comes to answering this, uh, this question. So it's fairly similar to what we did as well. Uh, with uh, Andreas loving or hating me. So basically, uh, for, for these models, you can ask them what is the master it's made of in that image, and it would say banana, but you can ask it in all kinds of other ways that definitely don't have that answer. It would still produce that answer. So knowing that is not just good in order to produce training data, which then can regularize the model and make it less vulnerable. Just understanding what's going on is crucial. So I think there's a long line of work that does these probes uh, of the models and understand how it works. And I, I see a lot of the academic research, uh, especially in universities, sort of going in that direction. Partly because uh, for all the other work, you need like massive clusters right now of, of uh, GPUs to train your bird models better. So, so that, that's, I think, if you're looking for if you're a PhD and you don't have access to uh, massive clusters, and uh, massive numbers of engineers can help you with building uh, better pre-training. Generally, I think model diagnostics, uh, adversarial training, all of that is, is an interesting direction to go to. Um, uh, and then obviously there's pre-training. So, um, you know, instead of just using QA data to feed these models, we want to use um, unlabeled data, uh, essentially doing some sort of like um, autoencoding of uh, unlabeled text to recover it. And uh, I guess you've heard about Elmo, so I'm not gonna talk much about this. I talk in the last sort of five minutes briefly about BERT, uh, which essentially is like Elmo. It's just using transformers, and because of that, it also uses a slightly different training, a quite different training objective. So if you remember in uh, Elmo, your training objective is essentially like a language model objective, 
uh, standard, like left to right and left and, and right to left. You're just trying to maximize the um, cross entropy of these, these sequences in, in a teacher forcing way. Um, that is not quite as obvious to do in a transformer because in a transformer, everything is connected with everything else all the time. So you can't easily not see the future. Um, so you always have at any sort of point, and that's part, part of the whole point of the transformer, you have access to everything that comes before and after. And while there has been work like uh, XLNet uh, that uh, deal with that issue in different ways, um, BERT has dealt with that issue in a, uh, I think, quite simple and, and still very effective way. So let's talk about that quickly. So this is Elmo. Uh, you go, you have this one left to right LSTM producing at training time the output, and you have one right to left LSTM also producing the output, and then at training time you combine the representations from the left uh, right and the right left decoders in order to produce a representation that you, that you then use downstream. So that's that. Uh, BERT is essentially a transformer where you produce the, uh, the representations being fully aware of every token and every representation at all times using, as I said, transformers. Now, the interesting bit is how you do the multi-train, sorry, how you do the pre-training here. And, and BERT essentially innovated two things that made this work. Um, the first one is mask language modeling. So remember, ELMO is essentially a, a language model and you teach it to produce left to right or right to left a particular unlabeled text in your data. Um, but doesn't quite like that. Instead, it hides certain words in the text that you need to produce, and you're asked to produce those hidden words. Uh, more technically, it chooses 15% of the tokens, replaces them with a mask, and then asks the model to predict those. So let's say, let's stick it to improvisation in the skit. Uh, you take that and you sample a number of words uh, that you want to hide. Let's say improvisation, you mask it, then you throw it through your transformer. You say transformer, like come up with representations here, then use the representation on top of that mask token and produce a softmax from that, which should give you improvisation with a high probability. And you essentially have a cross entropy loss on top of that. So that in a nutshell is bad. Um, so you do that on a lot of data. And if you do it right, and if you set your Hyperparameters as well, uh, you can do amazing things with this. Like, so I, I'm sure most of you know this, but I think this year was striking and, and crazy in, in a way that has changed everybody's way of thinking about NLP. Uh, and, and definitely Bird and Elmo were somewhat responsible, responsible for that. I find it hard to sort of think about problems to solve now. I mean, it's not that NLP is solved by any means, but it, it really changes the way that everybody thinks about it and what you do. Uh, and, and the same in question answering. There's this other bit, uh, namely next sentence prediction, that is also an objective in BERT, but actually I don't think it matters that much. Uh, I think Jacob Devlin will disagree, but what the Roberta work out of FAIR showed is that actually you don't really need it. Um, so you don't have to do the sen next sentence prediction when you do pre-training. You can just, do, just use the math language model and you'll be fine. Um, so you can use BERT for all kinds of things, including classification. Um, but you can also use it for machine reading. And this is essentially the picture I showed you earlier. You take the question, you take the paragraph, feed it through the transformer, get representations at the top, then use those to predict start and end. And that's it. Um, it's really quite beautiful in, in how simple it is as far as uh, the architectural Uniform, uniformity. Uh, and uh, seen quite dramatic improvements. So we're now really quite, with an ensemble met method, some extra data, really quite above the human performance, actually in terms of exact match, even, even more. Like that's, that's crazy. Um, and so let me say that the model that I was playing around with is not this. So I think this model will do uh, much will make much less mis mistakes, much fewer mistakes, um, but it will still make very similar mistakes. And these adversarial examples that I showed you and the work that we're doing is actually on BERT and it still fails in exactly the same ways. 
Um, so still a lot of room for, for future work uh, to get this right. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm getting close to the end of this lecture. Just to summarize, um, I think there are a couple of directions. I think one is refining the task better. For example, indicating that you want solvable and unsolvable questions, diagnosing it, adversarial training, and better prior models for contextualized representations. I think these are four dimensions that people are looking at in terms of pushing this work further. Um, there are a lot of other challenges, but I'm running out of time. Uh, I will share these slides with you. I um, guess let me just quickly jump to the conclusion for the sort of bigger picture bigger picture view. So I think it's fair to say that there has been this paradigm shift in the way that we think about machine reading and for a couple of years, uh, moving from symbolic meaning representations to latent vector representations that are usually conditioned on the question as opposed to processed or independently of all possible questions ahead. Um, Essentially, you could say that to some extent feature engineering and domain expertise was somewhat replaced by architecture engineering and ML and DL expertise. I think that was true until uh, this year. I feel I haven't seen as much architecture engineering anymore. That's, I think, going out of fashion as well. And, and most of the work is essentially here's Bert and then like a very thin layer on top of it. Uh, that does something and let's figure out how to break it or make it better in other ways. But uh, I've seen fewer, here's like three blocks of this here and four blocks of that. And if you, you know, shake them, uh, something good comes out. So that's, uh, that's not so much a thing anymore. Um, I talked about automatic knowledge based construction. Uh, which has a couple of advantages, fast access, scalable, interpretable. Uh, as I mentioned, I think it's really useful if you want to interpret and look at data, it can give you a different access to it. Supports reasoning. Um, it is sort of universal in the sense that the representation that you produce in this graph isn't tailored to a specific question. It's maybe tailored to a set of questions that you have in mind that you will ask later, but uh, nevertheless, it's broader than just saying, Here's that one representation for that one single question. Uh, it's less robust to variation language, cascading errors, schema engineering, and annotation is quite, ex uh, quite expensive. Also talked about enter and machine reading, uh, which has a bunch of examples, sorry, a bunch of advantages. It's more robust, uh, not as many cascading errors, no cascading errors, I'm not sure if that's, that's correct. Um, fewer domain expertise required. It's actually, and I haven't talked about this, super easy, uh, conceptually to do, say, visual Q&A in the sort of end-to-end -end Q and a framework. You just plug in a image encoder or maybe some kind of attentive image encoder into the, into the model, and, and there you go. So I think that's, that's really amazing. Um, and often QA is relatively easy to annotate. So ask a human to come up with questions and answers, that's possible. Ask them to come up with semantic representations, much harder. Um, disadvantages, sometimes it's not that scalable, actually. Uh, we still haven't fully understood how to combine, say, retrieval with question answering. And that's one thing I didn't talk much about, uh, which I had in the slides, is so-called open domain QA. So everything I showed you was, I give you the context, and then I have some questions, uh, then you answer them, which is great, but really, if you think about a real use case, that seems really stupid, because if I already have the right information there, I'll just read it. I mean, it doesn't take me that much to read this one bit of text. The interesting thing about QA is when there's so much data out there that uh, uh, you can't read all of that and you just want the answer, right? So, so finding the relevant data, then representing it, and, and then coming up with the answer, that's, I think, the real problem. And how we deal with sort of memory issues in that context is, is super juicy in my view. So. Should we put everything into one transformer? Which clearly wouldn't scale, uh, but maybe we can conceptualize it that way. Or should we always have a, um, or should we always have an information retrieval step followed by some kind of reading step? 
which, which is one way. Um, but I also think that there are many other ways. So one of the things we have doing recently is to just think about a language model like BERT as an actual question answering model. And it's quite remarkable. So we have an EMNOP paper coming up where if you just ask BERT, when was, a Barack, when, when was Barack Obama born uh, by using a mask query like Barack Obama was born in year X, then BERT is fairly good compared to comparable uh, relation extraction systems in predicting that number. Um, whether it knows that or it just guesses it is, is a really interesting question because uh, I had this discussion with somebody else. If I ask you, um, where was Sebastian Riedel born, even though you don't know me and you haven't heard my English, even then you probably know that I'm in, from Germany because that's just a very German name. So did you know that I'm from Germany or did you guess it, right? And where does that change? It's like Bert is really good at guessing. It's not clear whether it knows, but it's also not clear what that even means. So I think there are really interesting questions in this whole space uh, that if you're doing re research in NLP, I think you should be working on. If you uh, do applied NLP and you use our techniques, well, you need to wait a bit until we really make progress. All right, um, that's it, thank you.